Weather Brains, episode number 443 for July the 21st, 2014. We are in the pre-show. And if you are new to this show, this is that magical part of the program where we set things up, we bring on our guests, we work out technical errors, we come up with show titles, we say outrageous things. Um, could be the best part, could be the worst part, you never know. So if you want to watch the produced version of this show, just move the slider about 10 minutes over, and that's when everything starts to happen. So we are cooking through summer. We have Rick Smith, who is in a new studio this evening. Rick, you look good in there. I'm in the old studio with new equipment. I'm, uh, ah. I've gotten off the iPad, and I'm using a laptop, and I have a new microphone. What kind of mic do you have? It's a blue snowball. Oh, yeah, those are good. I have one, and I've used it, and it uh, works very well. So, uh, but I've got like a half-second delay on the audio here, so it's a little... It's going to take some getting used to. Yeah, the, uh, occasionally I will get some latency introduced uh, for me, in, but it's related to uh, Audio Hijack. Pro, which is the uh, bit of software that I use to do the magic here. I, 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 that's how we uh, route these marvelous sound effects, like down the uh, Google Plus channel, and that's how we record uh, my audio, and it's how we record the Google Plus audio every week. Um, and occasionally, some latency will just kind of have to re hijack the uh, stream there, but uh, anyway. No, th those are good mics. Uh, got Dr. John. I am here, gentlemen. I am here. In the, right, in the right place in the wrong time. I bet you I'm the only guy on this show that remembers the show, the song, Right Place, Wrong Time by Dr. John from 1973. <laughs> One of our producers always calls me that. She runs around the studio saying, Dr. John. That was a great song. In fact, uh, I, you know, if, I, if we weren't going to be arrested by the RIAA for playing that, I, I would play some of that here. You know, tra traditionally, the way we've always done music, we, we play less than 30 seconds of a song. Hopefully, that if we're sued, we can claim fair use and get away with it, but uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, now, that was a... Uh, I think Dr. John was from New Orleans. Uh, yes, was that's right. A Louisiana guy. Um, that's true. But, you know, 1973, I was um, a, let's see, 17, which means I was 13, uh, 45 years ago, watching Man on the Moon. Oh, I <laughs> um, my, my mama let me stay home from school that day. I loved, loved the space program. I, I could not wait for those space shots and uh, to watch the I'd watch the pre-launch the launch I mean I'd watch as much as I as I could but she let me stay home that day and uh, or actually it was in the summer that the other one of the moonwalks I stayed home that was a summer deal uh, it was in July but uh, it was just yeah. marvelous I had that was chill. the first one July yeah. 1969 yeah and, and I love watching the documentary about the mission control guys called called failure is not an option <laughs> And you will learn what true scientists are by watching those guys. These were young, basically 20-something engineers that didn't know any better. No, no, nobody told them you can't go to the moon. And, and you know They were using slide rules in the trench. And who knows how to use a slide rule anymore? Uh, and, and you know how primitive computing power was in, in 1969. And uh, what they did was just stunning. I, I think Gene Kranz is a really good speaker. Gene... Uh, uh, oh, I, I, I love the way he talks about that mission. Yeah, you you seen Apollo 13? Yes, oh, yes. A, I'd, I'd like to meet Gene Kranz. He must be yeah. an amazing guy. Yeah, and I mean, he, um, you know, he said, thinking back on that event, uh, on July 20th, 1969, when, when man first, when they landed and they walked on the moon that day, he, they were so busy that they couldn't really appreciate the moment. And they just wish they could go back in time and relive that, but this time enjoy it and understand the historical significance of what they did. Uh, but that, that whole thing was so fraught with danger. Uh, to, to think that they made that successful 
in the right time frame, got them there safely, got them back. Uh, I, I read something that was really eerie this week where uh, I guess it was Nixon or I guess it was Nixon. He, he had a speech ready if they were stranded on the moon and if they could not get back. And uh, it's, it's very eerie. But anyway, the, those were some amazing times. And I, I'm thankful I was alive to see that because most people today were not. They have heard of it, but they were not there. So it's one of the advantages of being old. Uh, I still have the front page of a paper from the day after the first moon landing. Somewhere I've got that. Wow. Um, all right, so we're going to bring our guest on here. Uh, by the way, Aubrey is gone. Her, her internet access is out. P people are going to think she's dumped us, you know, like Kevin <laughs> dumped us. I mean, she, Aubrey's not been on the show in a month, and, and I, I will assure you she, we actually have not made her mad. She's just It's a set of unfortunate circumstances, uh, but she, she has no internet access, so she's out. Now, Brian did send some cryptic notes. Did you guys see that one? Uh, no. He, he sent a, I guess he just sent it to me. Uh, he just said, uh, hate to do it at the last minute, but I'm out. It, it sounds like one of these Kevin Silly things, kind of like this. Howdy, folks. Sorry I couldn't join you all this evening. It is my 18th anniversary. I did want to get in a quick plug for our new Weather Insiders series kicking off on Tuesday. These conversations. This is not the one I thought it was. Kevin's actually explain, <laughs> explaining this one. Normally, he doesn't explain it. Stations will be a little inside <laughs> baseball for broadcast meteorologists, but all are invited and welcome, and I would love your feedback. You can watch the show live, see the video after the fact, or get more information at weatherinsiders.com. Which brings to mind, I wonder what happened to Weather Insiders. Uh, I was a guest on that show once, and I, I loved it. I mean... Uh, Maybe it's on hiatus or something. But normally when Kevin would send a note, he'd say, I'm out, I'm out, um, <laughs> with no explanation. And Brian says, let's see. Um, where is it? Too much email. Yeah, sorry for the late bailout. I don't have a WeatherBrains 101. I did get a draft of the show notes done. I'm out. So who made Brian mad at us? I think it's Rick. Was it you? Oh, you're muted. I hope it wasn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. There you go. I hope it wasn't me. I don't think so. Now UWCM stick together. Yeah, we're we're just like that. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna bring on uh, uh, Gary England. Um, and, and again, you know. The, let me just say this to those that are watching. And again, we're in the pre-show here. This is not the actual show. And, uh, uh, you know, Rick is in a situation where Rick works with all television meteorologists in Oklahoma City. And, and that, that, I will say it's a hard position to be in where, where you, you know, you can't show favoritism or what. We would, I, I understand the situation. So if sometimes Rick maybe passes on a question or a comment, that's the deal. Because you, you are, you just have to work with everybody. That's and, right. Uh, we understand that. So enough said on that. So let me see if I can bring in our guests. Uh, Shelby Hayes is going to join us. Uh, Shelby is a former guest. Uh, she's been on the show before. She is in, uh, I want to say, Fort Smith or Fayetteville, Arkansas, Rick? Uh, you yeah, might... Fort Smith. Okay. Uh, she She's an OU product, and uh, she... She dropped by here uh, last summer to say hi. It was great to meet her, and she's uh, uh, she went to see Ginger Z, our friend in uh, in New York at Good Morning America, and uh, she is uh, doing a great job. And she also, I believe, interned for Gary England while she was in Oklahoma City, so she probably has some Gary England stories to share. <laughs> See, I think we're going to have a record number of viewers tonight watching the count go up here. I mean, see, see it's uh, the, the Weather Channel thing is good for us. I mean, it, people think we're mad about the Weather Channel. I think it's great. It's a great compliment, and, and, and I'll talk about that once the show starts. But yeah, uh, we should. We should. Yeah, it's everybody. Every, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that doesn't like Marshall Shepard. He's great, and uh, uh, you know, he he told us what's going on, and and we're in on it. And I think it's a great compliment because th these shows, while they're similar, they are still different uh, oh, yeah. in, in a lot of different ways and we'll talk about that oh okay. Shelby hey, so are you in uh, Oklahoma or Arkansas I'm in Arkansas Fort Smith 
Okay, so we, we know you work uh, weekends. Or, like, what do you do during the week, and what what days do you work? Uh, I'm, I these work. Are nosy personal questions. <laughs> I work Saturday through Wednesday in the mornings. I do uh, weather on Saturday and Sunday. Then I do traffic Monday through Wednesday mornings. Ooh. Yeah. I do, I do I do traffic on my Twitter feed. That's like all I do <laughs> half the time is traffic. I've, I've become a traffic guy. Do you I know. Have traffic I... in Fort Smith? Um, no. <laughs> it's good time hey. at the Green Wall, though. Hey, let's see if Gary can hear us. Gary, can you hear us? We're seeing a, a still image of you and no video. I can hear you. Let me click this thing again. Hold on. Yeah, you were loud and clear. Your audio sounds flawless. Okay, as, as usual, right? <laughs> For me. Um, so, do I hit join on this thing? Yeah, you're, you're yeah. good. Uh, uh, up there, uh, there's a little uh, gear that says settings, and you yeah. can go under that and choose your uh, video yeah. oh, device. These are, the, these are the choices we had this afternoon when I worked with Bill. So, Bill and I had a great time. Got to know him very well. Yeah, he said he said the test went uh, went fine, um, but we, we're seeing your uh, avatar, your your still image, which is a very nice publicity photo there. <laughs> I, mean, I wish I wish I looked that good. Let me uh, see what I've got here. Hold on. Okay. Now let's go back to you guys. Got you right there. The video coming up at all? Where's Bill? Bill, talk to me, baby. <laughs> Yeah, Bill left the chat for some reason. <laughs> that that must be the West uh, Coast boy right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm watching you guys fine. Let's see. Okay, camera's on. Uh, microphone's on. Okay, I've got your picture up. I see my picture down in the bottom there. Says live. Goodness no, goodness. you're 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 good. You're definitely in the hangout, and you were live as could be. We, and again, Gary, if if we by some chance can't get your video, it's okay. I, I, we're still okay. at a point where about seventy five percent of the people listen to this show. That this is a core uh, podcast, audio podcast. But having said that, we have some really big numbers. A lot of people are watching, so they would love to see you. If and we'll wait for a second to to, to get Bill back because uh, he. Uh, had an audio issue and he had to restart his computer, so he'll be back here in just a second. But uh, do you, Gary, are you using a uh, like an external USB video camera or? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Nice. Thing. And the, uh, the the mic is on it. Camera indicates on. Let me take a look right. here. Again. So yeah, if, you, if you if you click on that little gear up there that says settings, the first uh, option is to select your camera. Okay. Uh, and um, all right, we've got uh, microphone, webcam, C ninety K. Yeah, that's it, brother. It's on. All right. We'll, we'll, like we'll, the picture's not coming through there. We'll wait till Bill gets back on here and since since he did the test with you uh, today, I am. I, I might add it was like a three hour test. That's <laughs> awesome. Like never got it right. Wow. <laughs> Gary's going to so send us did. an invoice because he bills by the hour for his uh, time here. So uh, it's going to be a long uh, test. Uh, and by the way, welcome to our uh, cable television viewers that are watching in my market. Uh, we're glad you're with us. And uh, uh, we will start the show here momentarily. We've got Nate uh, here, and we got uh, Dr. John. Yeah. got uh, Rick, and we have Shelby. Gary, I assume you know Shelby, don't you? Uh, absolutely. She's... Uh you know, she's an intern with us, and she's a meteorologist with us, and she, you know, she rode out some of the big tornadoes with us, and one of the things that really amazed me, being a young person, she jumped right in and did a terrific job, and a lot of times they just freeze. She did, she did fantastic. So she didn't panic. <laughs> she did not panic at all. Very stable, uh, very intelligent, very wonderful person. <laughs> wow. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Hey, oh, I, didn't, I didn't know you could hear that, Shelby. <laughs> sure, Shelby, I think you're rotten, no good, and low down. Somebody's got to balance that out, you know. I mean, uh, we don't want you getting a big head here. Um, all right. Well, I don't James, know what happened. Have you, have you invited Morgan yet? Oh yeah. That's not. We got our the guest pipes. weather pipes. 
this guy is the greatest voice in America. And I've got uh, my uh, I've got my bass adjust here on my mixer, so I can try and compete. But no, no way, will. buddy. <laughs> Morgan has the greatest voice in in weather. Period. I mean, we. Oh, oh, oh! I see a Gary there. We've got video. There we, there we go. go baby. All right. That's good. Now I tell you, the uh, audio cord's a bit short, <laughs> so I put my chair almost down to the floor. So uh, if I'm struggling with it, you don't know what the deal is. But tell me more about that voice. I well, that he's voice. here, Morgan. Hey there, can you hear me? Oh my God! Oh, <laughs> Hold on, let me turn this down. Jeez. But, all right, how is everyone tonight? Uh, we're good, Morgan. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that should be against the law to have a voice like that. No. So let me let me crank up my bass here and see if I can. <laughs> no, it just doesn't work. It's just no, it's man, not you're, the same. You're, you're you're so hot. You're almost distorted, Nate. I mean, back that thing <laughs> down, man. I mean, uh, that's great. Whatever you did, Gary, you kickstarted it. So, so that's good. So, yeah, I uh, so got some video now, so we're in reasonably good shape. Okay, let's try that again. All right, I'm back. Here we go. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's get this. I'm going to get the record button. I, I want to go ahead and get this recorded because I just sense that uh, this could be a good show, and I don't want to miss anything. So uh, here we go in five, four, three, two, one. Weather brains. You know exactly what this is. This is Weather Brains, the weekly show that is all about the weather. This is episode number 443 for the 21st of July, 2014. We are in summertime, and boy, we got a good show tonight. Uh, I'm James. Thank you for taking the time to watch. And we've got a big cast of characters on the show, including our own Nate Johnson, maybe the biggest character of all from <laughs> WRAL Television in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I, I'm seeing a note in the chat room. You're putting the office back together after turning <laughs> it over to the cats for two weeks. Please. Yes. So we were. This is last night. My my daughter is my younger daughter is two months old yesterday, and last night for the first time in a month since her first month birthday, our family, my wife and our two kids, slept in our house as a family with no other people here. It's been a month. Since wow. we've done that, so we had a there was a week at the beach, and then uh, I we took the girls down to Texas to visit my 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 in laws and to spend some time there, and then I came back because you know somebody's got to work, and and then my wife kept the girls down there. She was on maternity leave, and so just as easy for her to do that in Texas as it was for her to do it here. So she got to spend some time with her family and everything. But they came back Saturday night. And then her dad stayed with us on Sunday, and then he flew back uh, Sunday night. And so last night was the first night in in a month that we've uh, spent the uh, spent the the night as a family. Well, while we were gone, and for most of the time while they were gone, the cats had this room because it's got a hardwood floor, and sort of we turned it over to them and just let them do whatever they want to and whatnot. And so I just spent the last hour putting this room back together from. Uh, yielding it to the cats. And I've got all my audio equipment here, and it's covered in dust and cat hair. And you know how the cats like to play with the settings. You know, they, they just, you know, opposable thumbs or not, they like messing with the knobs. So wow. if I well, sound well, over-modulated, that's why. Okay. No, you sound good. All is back in order after the uh, cats have had their uh, fun. So uh, good to have <laughs> I mean, I can't compete huh. with Morgan. I'm doing my best here, but, you know, it is what yeah, it is. No, we're, we're going to bring in our special guest here in just a second. Let me bring in uh, uh, regulars. Uh, we got Rick Smith, who is in a brand-new studio with brand-new equipment. Rick, uh, you're looking good, man. He actually spent yeah, money on this. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully the... Hopefully the new microphone sounds good. I don't have enough bass adjustment to reach the Morgan Palmer level, but uh, we'll, we'll no try. one does. I know. I think I, I think I, I had my subwoofer up too loud when he first spoke, and I think a window <laughs> cracked. And sorry about that. <laughs> sorry sorry the about bill. that. <laughs> you probably get that a lot from time to time, uh, right? So, uh, do yeah. Dr. John uh, is another. Another one of our regulars who is up in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, let's see, you, you've had thunderstorms and plagues of locusts and all kind of stuff up there. I guess it's calmer tonight, huh? Yeah, much calmer, James, much calmer. In fact, uh, no rumbles outside tonight. In fact, uh, gotten rid of some of the rain that we had recently. It's been relatively comfortable. 
as I posted on my Facebook page today, today is a, an interesting anniversary. July the 21st, uh, 1983, was when East Antarctica dropped to minus 128.6 degrees. Wow. Was that because of the polar vortex? Yes, exactly, Nate. It, it dropped all the way to Antarctica. <laughs> So we've already got the polar vort the vortex buzzer going early. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, so, I couldn't uh, resist. So let, let's go ahead and bring in Morgan Palmer is is in Seattle, and uh, all kidding aside, M Morgan is a, uh, a great television meteorologist, a great scientist who just happened to be born with a big pipes. So we're all jealous, Morgan. Well, you know, it just uh, just happens to be that way, and we just have <laughs> up here in the Seattle Pacific Northwest a lot of fires going on right now. It's beautiful in 72 here in Seattle right now, but we have some terrible wildfires going on in eastern Washington. Uh, hundreds of square miles burned, hundreds of homes now burned, and now one fatality from wildfires. And uh, there's really no relief in sight. We could have some thunderstorms on Wednesday, and that's not good news east of the Cascades. It'll give us some rain here west of the Cascades, but uh, east where they need the rain, uh, they're not going to have it anytime soon. Hey, Mor Morgan, were these fires mostly set by lightning or were Mainly. they set by right. humans? H how were they set? Ma mainly lightning caused. Uh, don't have any any reports of arson caused fires, and and this is a pretty rural <laughs> area, but there have been a few uh, towns. In fact, the one town of Pateras, Washington, uh, a few hundred population was totally wiped out uh, down toward the Columbia River, and it's just a terrible situation over there. Uh, fortunately, today and tomorrow, as the onshore flow has weakened, we're seeing the winds uh, far less than the uh, 30 to 50 mile an hour wind gusts that they saw over the weekend when it was just uh, out of control. Wow. And one more question. Is that your real hair? <laughs> <laughs> Well, man yeah. can't have good hair and good pipes, James. You just you're yeah. jealous. I think that's what it is. No, I am. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, no, nobody yeah. should look like that and have that kind of voice. I mean, it, wow. Yeah, you know, the ha the hair actually comes from my mother's side. Two uncles, six five, deep voices, head of hair. I guess it's genetic. Oh boy! All right. <laughs> he he. So another uh, person with good hair is Shelby Hayes. Shelby is. Oh. Uh, in northwest Arkansas, she is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Yay. She interned with our special guest we're about to introduce, and uh, she is now on her own, like Mary Tyler Moore. Are you in Fort Smith or Fayetteville? I am in Fort Smith. We have a bureau in Fayetteville, but the main location is Fort Smith. Okay, first off, this item behind you on the wall, is that a scorpion? That's kind of cool. Uh, what is oh, this thing here? it's a seahorse. I'm pretending oh, I'm at the it's a seahorse. Beach. Great. Right. <laughs> on vacation now that I'm not in school, beach okay. themed house. <laughs> so we have many questions. We, we always like to have our younger guests that, that are out of school and starting a successful career. A lot of people that watch this want to do the same thing. So we're going to ask some questions. But we see, I see Bill Murray has joined us. Bill, uh... Uh, apparently had to uh, go to his uh, masseuse or something uh, in this resort he's in. Bill, where are you? Well, I'm playing the role of conventioneer tonight, James, at the uh, State Hospitality and Tourism Conference here in Alabama. And uh, it's in Auburn at the uh, Auburn Hotel and Conference Center. So, now, uh, Let me hear you say War Eagle. Say you, it. Know, I, you know, James, did you see my Facebook post from last night? No. I, I was with the Auburn Eagle Nova, and, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, God gives you those things that are going to, you know, uh, you get you for any, you know, for anything that you may have thought over time, you know, as an Alabama fan, and, uh, you know, it's hard to not like an eagle. You know, it is no, just you, you know, it's, it's not American. You are not an American if you don't like an Eagles. And it is such a beautiful campus, and the people here are so nice, like John Wilde, who's in charge of the Convention Bureau, and, and all the folks here. So um, it's given me a, a, a brand new appreciation for another team in the SEC besides the one I pull for. All right. And by the way, Bill, you might want to back your mic down just yeah. ever so slightly. You're kind of like Nate. You're slightly uh, hot. But having said that... Um, I'll let you introduce our special guest, Bill. Yeah, yeah, James. You know, it's an oft-used line uh, when we introduced guest weather brains lately, and tonight's guest weather brain is one of those that needs no introduction. 
Uh, that's about as true as any time I've ever said that on this show. He's a return guest weather brain. He appeared in December 2009. That was show 202, James Mann. Mm-hmm. That was a long time ago. Uh, but, of course, he's an icon in Oklahoma where he recently retired as arguably one of the most admired television meteorologists in America. Gary England, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to see you again. We spent a little time together this afternoon. Yes, we did. And uh, you, you uh, actually, Gary, uh, you know, it was incredible to me, you know, because I figure at, uh, you know, at Channel 9, you had like, you know, minions that ran around and, and did all this technology for you. But, uh, boy, you really, I mean, you put together what is the equivalent of an engineering booth there in your house this afternoon. Well, it's pretty interesting, except, you know, my, uh, my audio cord is about three feet too short. <laughs> I'm kind of short myself, you know. Gary had so much equipment that it was conflicting. The, the headphone was conflicting with the webcam, and, uh, and and so eventually we decided that he was just going to do the show, James, lying prone on the floor. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <just> <laughs> But uh, but we were we were uh, thankful to get you on the air. Thank you for your patience today, uh, Gary. Uh, Google Plus is not always the most intuitive thing, and you mastered it right out of the box. So we appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. It was it was fun. It's great to be on with you guys tonight, and of course with Shelby now over in Arkansas. And like I said earlier, she uh, she rode out with us and worked out so was some of the big tornadoes, the Woodward tornado, right there through the whole thing. It was uh, quite amazing to see someone with coming out of college, in college at that time, and being able to handle the, an event like that. And she wasn't just going and getting a piece of paper. She was involved in the coverage, so it really, to her credit, was absolutely outstanding. So, so the last time you were with us, Gary, was, was in '09, And, of course, the Woodward tornado was, what, in the spring of 2011 or 12? Yeah, I think, yeah, I believe it was. Yeah. So, so tell that. that story, Shelby and Gary. Talk about that. That was a late-night Saturday night tornado, wasn't it? Yeah, they always seem to come on the weekends, or they come late, not always, but it sure seems like. But the Woodward Tornado, it was, uh, there was an outbreak of tornadoes earlier in the day uh, through northwestern Oklahoma, and it's pretty good, uh, pretty good size. You know, lots of video. There's so many storm trackers, storm chasers out there. They're just tripping all over each other. And then the storms move on off, and then we had tail end Charlie form, and that was about uh, a little before midnight, half hour before midnight when it set down out southwest of Woodward. And started moving. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Started moving northeast, and it ripped through Woodward, did a lot of damage, killed several people. And uh, we have a storm tracker that lives there, Marty Logan, and he was able to uh, th- audio-wise, and we were on the radio also to talk to people through it. They were having a graduation party at the fairgrounds, and fortunately, they got all those kids out of there before the tornado got there. But it was a pretty exciting night. All the power was out, and and uh, the, the thing about uh, Shelby is, she can get that deer in the headlight look just like the rest of us. <laughs> so, yeah. Shelby, tell us some stories from that night. Oh, a night I'll never forget for sure. And deer in the headlights probably explains it perfectly. But I don't know, I'll just never forget that night. You know, we'd worked all day already. There had already been storms. And then Woodward Tornado gets going. And Marty just walks the tornado into town. He knows everything that's going on. And it's just really brought to home, like, how important it is to know what's going on in those towns. Like, if he hadn't have known that, you know, the prom party was going on, would they have got the information in time? And just, I remember Gary and, you know, my first time really, really involved with tornado coverage and Gary saying, you know, people are dying right now. Mm -hmm. And just that thought that you're part of what might keep them from dying. And it's just, scary night, but learned a lot. You bring that up, and that's one of the things I think is very difficult about severe weather coverage. There's many things, but, you know, it's high pressure, it's high stress, and, uh, you know, let's say you have a significant tornado in a populated area, and you start seeing all those power line flashes, and you know people are dying. There's not anything you can do about it. You know, you've done your best, you've told them to get out early, you know, make their plans early, all those things, and still we have fatalities. So it's, it's a high stress deal, and and Shelby's very fortunate she got some uh, very good experience with the, with the storms in here. Of course, we, we have a lot of practice here. Yeah, you, you get a little bit too much practice there, Gary. Uh, yeah. You know, back in 2009 when you were with us, it was one of our most memorable shows. And I'll, I'll you know, challenge all of our listeners to go back and, and download that episode. That's going to be my pick tonight. Because we covered a lot of your history, and I don't want to really rehash that, but you just talked about Woodward. So talk again about the 1947 tornado that had a big impact on your life and why you're interested in weather. Well, I was a little bitty boy, and I lived in Enid, Oklahoma. 
and uh, the storms were developing western Oklahoma. Of course, we didn't know it, but the sky was covered with mamatas. You know, just those, those days we called those puffy clouds. And at sunset, it was just the pinkest sky you've ever seen. And uh, my dad turned to me and said, there's going to be a bad storm or, or a bad cyclone somewhere tonight. We go to bed, and uh, early in the morning, we hear the sirens of the police and uh, the fire trucks and the ambulances leaving from Woodward going to Woodward, which is a long haul. But we still didn't really know what had happened until we got up the next day. So it really impacted me. And then I moved back to Sealing, my hometown, which is about 30 miles from Woodward. And that's, you know, that's all people talked about for years was the, the Woodward tornado and for some pretty horrific stories. And so it made an impression on me. But, you know, for me, and I think a lot of you guys and gals in weather, you know, it's in your genes. It's, it's there. It's, uh, it's just there. You know, I, I, I photographed clouds, you know, when I was in fifth, sixth grade, you know, and I, I was always out there looking at the clouds going on my dad's bread route, and he'd show me, you know, the, the damaged trees or damaged homes from the night before. So it, it was a, a fascinating time. And moving back to Sealing there and hearing all those things about Woodward, you know, I was in, you know, and then as I probably mentioned, Harry Volkman came on the air in, in Oklahoma, and uh, that's the reason I really went into weather. He just made it so fascinating. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting trip, I can tell you that for sure. So, so, Gary, talk about in 1947 what it was like. Uh, you know, your dad was probably your weather forecaster, wasn't he? Dad, my dad was. Uh, you know, I, let me tell you, when I was in, in college, after I got out of the service, I was, uh, I was at college and I came home that one weekend and it was, it was in the winter and it was cold and blustery. And dad said, looks like to me it's going to snow a lot. And, you know, being the smart aleck young person that I was, I said, no way, Dad, it's not going to snow. And it, it snowed about 10 inches in ceiling that night. So <laughs> I learned to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but, you know, back then, the forecasters, they learned that people could forecast. And the, and the Native Americans and the Indians could forecast just based on history and what had been passed along. And it's been marvelous to watch all the changes in, in meteorology come through the years. Lots of tornadoes. You know, I've dealt with about a thousand tornadoes. I venture to say more than anyone else in the world, and some of them really up close and personal. And uh, you, when, you, when you figure how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of severe thunderstorms, it's uh, now I wonder why sometimes I was so sleepy. <laughs> like you guys, sometimes you don't sleep in this business. But mm -hmm. I think the main. Let me tell you, I'm just kind of going off here. One of the primary things that concerns me is uh, is getting the right information out. At the right time, you know, to me it's always kind of like, where is it, you know, what is it, what is it, where is it, where is it going to go, and what time is it going to get there. That's the vital stuff that needs to get out, but you never know how people are going to react. And, uh, I, you know, when, now during severe weather, which I haven't met that much, I listen and, and watch uh, television stations around the country. Some are excellent, you know, some uh, could improve somewhat. But so much of it, you can say whatever you want to say, and it gets out to the public, and then they make their decisions, and... Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad, but uh, it's communicating and understanding how the audience reacts to the words you use, which it seems so important to me. So did you spend a lot of time in your career, Gary, trying to analyze that and understand what made people respond and, and what worked really well for you? Well, what I, what I learned as I went along, I never set out just to do it, but uh, you know, when you have an event, and you go back and review it. You watch the tapes and see what was said and what happened and all those things. But as, as I went along, I learned that there's, for me and my audience that we have here, they appear to react to certain phrases I used. And so I tried to use it, and they would, that would indicate the severity of the storm. You know, we've, in the early years, we did hundreds of those uh, tornado warning continues Oklahoma County. Stay with uh, News 9, we'll keep you advised. And, you know, tornado warning continues, tornado warning continues. And we were, as we went along and got into the really big events, I realized that that didn't quite cover it, saying, so, you know, the tornado warning continues. Because to me, there's different levels of tornadoes and different, obviously, different threats from tornadoes. And so I learned as I went. I could write a book on it now, uh, but people do react strangely. And, you know, when we had the tornadoes a year or so ago, uh, it was interesting to go back and look and see how the people reacted. And uh, I think that was mainly panic that set in. But it's, there's so much to learn there. I think more and more the social scientists are getting into this and helping evaluate how people respond. But I got to tell you, you know, if there's a big tornado coming down your street, we probably don't know how we would respond. Uh, you know, I talked to a guy in 99, that was a big tornado, strong, the strongest winds ever, and, and, I, and he, he lived in Moore, and I said, how, how was it? He said, well, he said, the video, there's a problem here, he said, the video was so darn good, that tornado, we had 60 tornadoes that day in our viewing area, 
and then I think five F5s. You know, like some of you head down to the southeast at times. But he said, uh, I said, tell me, well, what was it? He said, well, I was just watching. I couldn't. He said, I kept watching television. It was it, it was so darn good. And he and he said he watched and watched, and he said he finally went to the window and pulled the shade back, and he said it was coming down his his street. And you know, it was it was a quarter mile wide. And so I said, what did you do? And he he looked at me and he said, well, I got in my pickup, and he said I drove about a mile south. And I said, really? I said, what did you do then? And he looked at me like I was totally crazy. He said, well, I took pictures. <laughs> it's really, really. You know how you tell there's a tornado in Oklahoma? There's a tornado warning. Everybody's outside looking up. <laughs> they, want, they, they want confirmation. They want confirmation. And nowadays, you know, with all the videos out there, especially the hel helicopters are out there, that adds a dimension uh, that is just is fantastic. You got a daylight storm. And you know, then if you got the helicopter, you know where the tornadoes are, and you know, you know, with the equipment we have, you know where they're going, you know what time they're going to get there, and you know basically what they're going to do. So you have everything you need. Uh, well, I think we got an overload of storm chasers uh, out there. We need either more highways or more land or something. But uh, I think it's just uh, it's, it's it's an exciting time with that, and maybe the drones are coming now. Mm. The drones will be out there, and who knows? They may surpass the helicopter. You just don't know. I've got a que uh, question for you, Gary. Um, yeah. Is there something when you look back at Moore or any of the other severe weather and tornado uh, episodes that you've been through that you would do differently in hindsight, especially now that you're out of the day-to-day -day fray of being in television weather? Is there something that you would have done differently as you remember back? Okay. Let me phrase it this way. There's probably a lot of things I could have done differently. But uh, with the, the major tornadoes, May 3rd, 99, and some of the other ones we've had, the big ones here in central Oklahoma, uh, we made pretty good decisions. And a lot of that sometimes is luck, you know. But we have uh, good equipment and good people. So we really made good decisions. On May 3rd, 99, when this, those storms, that one hit Oklahoma City and more, so that's the F5. It started, what, 120 miles southwest. It, it, the first warning on that came out at 4.30 in the afternoon. So we went all the way to 7.30 to get you know, get the people warned. And, of course, it was plowing its way into Oklahoma City. But it was, uh, I, I knew I'd made all those, uh, the State News 9 will keep you by, or tornado warning. And uh, I knew I had to say something else. I may have mentioned this when we talked before, but I said, at one point I said, uh, most houses will not sustain, will not survive this tornado. And it just kept coming. You know, and you, you can see the power line flashes. Just pow, 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 pow. And at one point I finally said, right after that, uh, I said, you know, you need to move to a place of safety. And it kept coming, and at that one point, I said, "You need to be below ground if you possibly can." Now that caused a lot of, you know, flack and all that. But it turned out, if you look at some of the research, it probably saved several hundred lives. Those people did take the precaution because they didn't hear the standard thing: tornado warning for more. They didn't hear that. Basically, what they heard: this sucker is going to blow every house away, and you in it if you don't take some precautions. That's what they heard. So that caused them to action. Uh, so. We did some good stuff, and I, I can't really think I should change. I'm sure there are. Uh, the, the tornadoes, uh, 2013 spring, May, the Norman tornado and the El Reno tornadoes, uh, those, uh, you know, like the, of course, the, the good forecasting, the weather service, and the storm prediction center, it's so easy to know when these are going to happen nowadays. So, you know, most of us, the, the day before and, of course, the morning of, we were telling people, make your plans, check on your kids, what's your safety precautions, Where, where's your wife going to be? You know, make your plans now because we were able to say there are going to be tornadoes in central Oklahoma and possibly in the metro. So I look at all that. We did some good. And the more tornado came through, and then we lost a, a terrible number of people. Uh, and I, and it's, it was difficult to kind of get over it. I'm not past it yet, exactly. But I, I ran into her. I, I met with a gal who's a teacher at one of the schools where the, where the kids were killed. And, and I, I found something very fascinating because I felt really horrible. She said, Gary, each of those classes had 22 kids. And she said, by the time the tornado got to our school in her class, she only had, she said she only had eight students left in the class. The parents had come and picked them up. So we did some good. It wow. could have been much worse. Uh, I, I don't know how, the, you know, sometimes there's bad information goes out, and that, that's going to happen. But uh, I could probably go back and find some spots. I, early on in my career, I can think of quite a few spots I wish I could change, but I can't. But the, the big ones, we've been able to do well. Uh, we've got a great partnership now with National Weather Service, Storm Prediction Center, all those folks, and uh, we have great equipment and great people in the field and great meteorologists, so it works very, very well. 
Hey Gary, speaking yeah. of the National Weather Service, good to talk to you again. Um, Nick, how are you? Good, good. Hey, I want to. You, you mentioned a minute ago the the gentleman that talked about how compelling that video is on television of the tornadoes. And you know, since May 31st of last year, there's been a lot of talk about chasers and the role yeah. that chasers play. Whether you're a, a you know a chaser for Channel Nine or another TV station or just a chaser out there mm -hmm. on your own, and I'm just curious, has your view changed at all uh, after what happened last year on, on the value of chasers and the value of that real-time video, that confirmation? I think we'd all agree that that confirmation is important, but speak a little bit about what you, what, what's your feeling about the chaser's role in all this and, and uh, responsible versus irresponsible chasing. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, first of all, free world, so they, everybody can chase as much as they want to. They just need to be more careful and think about other people. But my personal feelings on it, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, is that uh, you know, in the daylight with a big tornado, we really don't need an avalanche of people chasing that storm. If it's a daylight tornado, we've got it on radar, nailed down pretty close to where it is, and we'll have it on the helicopter, or we'll have it on ten, one of the ten city camps. So we basically know where it is. So I think with the advent of all the, the great equipment and the, the great job they do down at Norman, it uh, it lessens the, the the I think it lessens somewhat the uh, the I guess I would say va how valuable the storm chasers are. In some cases they're absolutely required and they've done great and wonderful things. But it's uh, it's changed my outlook a little bit. And the more you know, what what I don't like and I see around the country occasionally is people shouting and yelling, grown adult men shouting and yelling and scaring people. I don't, I don't like that. And May 20th, there may or May 9th, the more 20th, there may have been some, I don't know. I know on the 19th there was. On the 31st, on the, the El Reno tornado, it, uh, you know, it was huge and it was all that stuff. And it was, if you, if you look at our tape from that, the coverage, you'll hear me arguing with our storm trackers telling them that they're too close and to get out because they didn't realize the storm was expanding. And so, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, our helicopter got a little bit too close, just like everybody else, and they didn't understand how that rapidly that was expanding, what speed some of those individual vortices were moving at, what, 175 miles an hour forward mm -hmm. speed? You can't do anything. So my opinion is we need, all of us need to be a little more careful out there. Uh, and I think when they go out and make a lot of noise and, and really frighten a lot of people, a lot of people really do get frightened. People, when their kids are frightened, what do they call? They call the TV station. I've been called for years. More and more now, you need uh, almost a psychology department to work with these kids and some some of the younger people and some of the new people in there. You need someone to work with them because they're absolutely terrified. The wife of the coach of the Thunder, when she came here, she was terrified, as were most of those big old boys playing that game. Mm -hmm. And she came out the station. We gave her tour, talked about tornadoes, the equipment, and all that, and. And, uh, <clears throat> and worked with her a bit. But you know what she really thought, and I'm sure people moving in the outside think. When I finished telling her how it worked, that they had a life cycle, she said, you mean they just don't jump out and get you? I said, no, they don't. Mm. So, but anyway, with all this yelling and going on in the field uh, and getting extremely close is not necessary, and I think it, it harms the audience. Uh, it, uh, for now, for a lot of television stations, it makes great television. You know, it's exciting and all that. So there is a value to them, but I, I think great care needs to, to be given to it. And just one more follow-up. I think the example you and Shelby talked about earlier with the Woodward tornado back in April of uh, 2012, what Marty Logan did is a, to me is a prime example of how that should work and can work. And the information he was providing was extremely valuable and, and saved a lot of lives that night. No screaming, no yelling, and there was it was a valuable service and, and uh, so I think that's an example in my mind of, of how it can work. You're exactly right. If you don't know, Marty is one of our storm trackers who lives at Woodward, ex-fireman, stable, good guy, and he just walked that tornado right through town. Most of the power was out in town. He's still on the radio and uh, it, was, it was just amazing. He did what needs to be done. Now I can remember one time years ago, and I don't remember the date, but uh, tornado uh, circulation coming across Oklahoma City from the west. I don't know what it's 10 o'clock, midnight. And we had our storm trackers. They leapfrog each other. They they lined up on north south roads. And when it would go by them, then they scooted another mile or two to the east. And that's what it's about. They were absolutely astounding how they were ha able to handle that nighttime tornado. So at times that the storm chasers and storm trackers are absolutely invaluable. 
It's just uh, we got to careful. We just be so careful how we how we treat the audience. Thanks. Gary, you mentioned the, the May 3rd, 99 Plains uh -huh. outbreak. I covered that live for the Weather Channel. Uh -huh. I remember that event vividly. You were talking about the first warning coming out so much earlier in the afternoon. I remember that vividly. And then as this event progressed, I began to realize just how bad potentially this could be. And of course, that's the way it ended up. For me, as a meteorologist, that was probably my defining moment really? in my career. And I've been thinking about your career being so much more expansive than mine. Can you think back to a defining moment in your career and how that affected the way you broadcast? Well, uh, I've had a lot of defining moments in my life. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> but one I can remember. Uh, it's April, May. It's night. The rip right in the middle of the night. Uh, it came in from they had a, one one big supercell came all the way in from southwestern Oklahoma, did a little bit of damage in Bethany, western Oklahoma City, okay, Oklahoma City or Oklahoma County, and just kept coming eastward and and uh, you know I was so busy saying you know do this do this take your shovel the storms here going here blah 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 I didn't wasn't paying any attention really to the, the fact that it was moving right toward the television station and Val Castro was out there uh, about a mile or two southwest of us. And we have him live. There's a uh, engineering crew there. They do a fantastic job. So they, there's a big power flash, and you can see that engineer running through the through the field of the camera. He, and it was almost in slow motion, baby. And uh, he told us later. He said he was there, ready to shoot this approaching storm. And he looked over. And Val Castro was sitting beside him. And in Oklahoma, that's not a good sign if there's tornadoes around a thousand beside you, because <laughs> he can find the tornadoes. So anyway, that's Val yelled, Gary, it's coming to the station. I went, holy crap. We are so busy. We were all so busy doing this other stuff. And it was just, it, and it came toward us. Uh, and I yelled, get everybody out of the theater. This is a defining, uh, out of the room, a defining moment. And everybody took off, going every which way. And Jed Castle dove under the desk with his rear end sticking out. And I said, Jed, that's not going to do it. <laughs> with people running down the hall, it was wild, it was crazy, and you know the wind coming through that tower, it was an ungodly noise, and it came over us. So you see, you see the hook before it gets the radar, passes over the radar, and it sets down a little less than a quarter of a mile just northeast of us. They estimated, I think, did some damage around 150, 155 mile an hour. That's pretty much a defining moment because I had, I never really thought about what I would do if there was a tornado coming, and I was criticized some. I said, we got everybody out of there, and I said to Val. Now you keep talking, you know, I'm going to go ahead and go to the shelter. So I calmly walked down there. The time I got there, it was already passed, and it came back. Uh, I've always heard people say, well, you know, I'm going to go down with the ship. That's stupid. <laughs> it's just so stupid. And so you, you do your job your best you can, and you better take care of yourself because your wife will be highly upset if you get killed. <laughs> <laughs> So that was and that would be quite, quite, quite ironic, too, Gary. That happened. Now, Gary, I was watching you in uh, in Ardmore, Oklahoma. I think that was on a Friday night that night, and uh, I think that was a big night in the big city, huh? <laughs> it was Friday night in the big town, for sure, baby. Yeah, I hardly went to sleep that night when I got home. And I go home after a big deal like that, and I, you know, I have a little glass of wine, and maybe two glasses, and have some cheese, and maybe some nachos. <laughs> try to get settled down, but you know, I, you know, that could have just blown our tail right into Kansas. And you know, Val, fortunately, yelled, it's coming to the station, which actually scared everybody to death. They got him moving. It, uh, I have to tell you, here's what, here's what kind of tells you what the night was like. We had two producers up in the booth, one male, one female. And she, she told me later, he said to her, Jenny, you go ahead and go to shelter. I got it covered. You know, he said he's got his cowboy hat and his boots on. I got it covered. I got it covered. <laughs> so she took off, and she said about five seconds later, he ran up her back in the hall. <laughs> so, so he's not doing the slim pickings and Dr. Yeah. Strangelove thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, May 30th was a, a May, or May 3rd, 99, of course, was very, very much a defining moment. Yeah. Uh, years before that, a defining moment, and before we had Doppler, and watched a big storm come up through south, uh, south of us, came up through Moore, and killed several people in Moore. And you couldn't see anything. It looked like a hook. We had no way to look at the wind. And uh, I remember thinking about that. For a long time afterwards, you know, that came up just like a big thunderstorm, and it came in. It was a tornado wrapped up in it, and that'll cause you to give it some thought. You know, what do you do next time? It was very intense, but no sign there was anything there. Fortunately, now we have Doppler, and credit so many people out Norman for that. 
But other defining moments, of course, I missed the May 3rd. We had several there. Rick will remember the days of May 8th, May 9th, whatever it was. You know, we were having big tornadoes, and it went on for, I think we did a little space. We called it Three Days in May. And the time we got through those three days, we were a bit surly with each other. You know, everybody was tired, worn out, and a little foul mouth. But uh, all those events are defining moments. Uh, uh, we have a lot of other ones, but that's the primary ones. Gary, you got a couple of questions coming in on yeah. Twitter, and you talked about um, how you've really paid attention to some of the words and the phrases that you've used. And mm -hmm. Tom Miners from WBBJ in uh, Western Tennessee asking, "Do you feel like asking folks to take tornado precautions? Does that mean something regionally, or is that uh, something universal? Do you think that that anybody in any part of the country would would get what you mean there?" Well, it's an educational process. You know, when I worked in New Orleans, I worked down there for the offshore petroleum industry as an oceanographer and meteorologist, and we dealt with quite a few hurricanes. That went, We did that for four years, and I borrowed that from my boss, who was probably about one of the smartest people I met in my life. And they always took the hurricane precautions, and they used to evacuate the coast down there on his word. A.H. Glenn's his name, A.H. Glenn and Associates. But uh, when I came back to Oklahoma, I immediately used it on all warnings. But I, I'm sure early on they didn't know. But as time went along, people in Oklahoma understand tornado precautions, the ones that have been there. And there's sometimes, you know, you've got time to go ahead and say, you know, lowest level, smallest room, center part, preferably be in a, a, a safe room or get in the basement or get in the cellar. Uh, just uh, you, the time is so compressed in an event like that. You don't, sometimes you don't really have time to get all the information out because you're thinking of so many different people. And, and if you have more than one tornado, baby, you know, you, it's a little more difficult. But to answer the question, uh, in Oklahoma, they basically understand. Now, some may not, but it, it's, you know, take your tornado precautions. You know, you should have that in your mind right now. And we have spent years, we spent 40 some years saying, always, when you go to work on Monday, just plan what you would do along that route. Where would be the safest place to go? What would be your safety precautions going down that street? What building would you go into? Same thing if you had to go pick up your kids, or say, let's say you're at a, a shopping center. All those places you are and, and work. You have precautions for each one of those, depending on the degree of shelter and such. So hopefully that works, and uh, it would be great every time we could say, uh, okay, you need to do this, 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 this. There are sometimes you can't do it. And, and then, uh, and so you talked about the, um, and I, I tend to agree. I think that that um, at least from my experience, that that there's some folks that sort of get that, some folks that don't. You you sort of make some shorthands here to uh, to get things across, and I, I see how that is the thing. I got another question. Um, now that you're sort of out of the business, being able to take a step back and look at the landscape, you're watching a lot of coverage and everything. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a good time for young people, sort of like Shelby, getting into the business? Is this good? Is the career going to be as good to them as it was to you, or is that a... Um, are the glory days of broadcast meteorology behind us? Well, they're probably not behind, but, you know, I was very fortunate. I came at the right time, you know. I'm not tall, dark, and handsome. I walked in at the right time. Warnings weren't that good. Equipment wasn't that good. And I hit it off with the audience. I was lucky. Right time, right place. I think, you know, a lot of you listening know the television is a state, television business. is a brutal business as far as, you know, where you work and when you get fired and all these things. And it can be a wonderful, wonderful career. And I just think if a young person is, is good at what they do and they're solid and they're bright and can make fast decisions, because you have to have people that can make good decisions. And there are some people in some parts of the country don't make good decisions. And that's up to news directors when they hire them. But I just think uh, it's, probably, it's probably not what it's been because it's, it's morphing. As all of you know, it's changing rapidly from just television to all of the social media and all these things. And you're busy. You know, we even had, uh, before I left out there, we had... Uh, a, a, a social media meteorologist, Matt uh, Mailer, and he he sat there and he had all of our addresses for all of our uh, Twitter, Facebook, and he'd fire out one. He would listen to what I was saying and he'd fire that out, and it was marvelous. We reached so many so many people, and uh, so it, that's where it's headed. You know, we're you know it's like most television stations. We do TV and you know, we do radio and we do social media and you know and. We do the jig and we occasionally do the square dance. And I mean, it's just, uh, it's changed so much and it's so much different. When I first went in, there were three television stations, ABC and ABC and CBS, and that was it. So competition wasn't that bad, but the audience is fragmenting. 
So I, t I tell the students that uh, you can get your degree in meteorology, which is not easy to get, uh, but also get some uh, computer programming, take some business courses, get those because you might need them. You know, I I've seen it. You know, I've seen too many people mm -hmm. come through and go, you may need those things. So widen your horizon. I guess widen your base on your education is the thing. Hey, Gary, you mentioned social media, and uh, I've been impressed with how you really embraced social media as soon as Twitter became a thing. You were you were right out there on it, and you're still on it, and got over 33,000 followers, and, you know, and, and you're very interactive. I mean, you're not just pushing out information, you're also interacting with people, and I know people think it's the coolest thing in the world when Gary England follows them back on Twitter, and it's it's, it's cool to see people react to that, and how do, I mean, how do you think social media has changed, particularly here in Oklahoma? I mean, this is a different place. This TV market is different. The weather is, yeah. Yeah. you know, has its unique challenges. I mean, do you think social media has been a good thing here? Uh, what, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Was it was it a positive thing to have Twitter and Facebook come along when it did? I believe I believe it has been good. It could probably be refined. Of course, you know things change so quickly. You know, everybody goes, then they go to Instagram, they go to all these other locations. But I think the Twitter and the Facebook and those type of things are always going to be there. But it's a way to reach the audience that doesn't watch television and doesn't listen to the radio. And there's a bunch of those that don't watch television, they don't listen to the radio. You can hit them there. But I did some experiments along the way, just nothing high tech. But I found you could take and drive part of the television audience over the social media. And you could do the same thing. You could take social media and drive them uh, to the uh, television if you did the right things, if you said the right things and handled it in the right way. So I think it's been very good. I learn a lot. You know, sometimes that'll be the first sign I get of hail or something. Somebody sends in a Twitter, hey, I'm, you know, I'm out here at uh, near Anadarko, about five miles west, and I got baseball, not baseball, but, you know, good size hail or something. So a lot of great information flowing across, it gets it out there quickly. And I like bantering back and forth with the folks. It's just, It's fun. I get a kick out. For me, it's pretty entertaining, but I like it. I use it. And I think more and more it's going to grow, and uh, no telling where it'll all be, as you know, in five or ten years, but it's definitely something that has to be used. Yeah, Gary, as far as uh, social media goes, it's such a great uh, opportunity for us to get out there into e even the rural community yeah. to get out there and talk to folks. Um, I do have a question about how what, what sort of decision making and, and how you went about it in your mind when you had let's say three severe thunderstorms, let's say three tornadic thunderstorms with three tornadoes on the ground, two might be out to the west or out to the southwest with confirmed tornadoes on the ground, one closer to the metro area. How did you juggle that and what sort of advice would you give to folks? I worked in Tyler, Texas, a pretty large market yeah. for nearly nine years and it was hard to juggle between different storms yeah. because of the, uh, uh, just simply because of the proximity from the population centers. Yeah. How did you handle that and what sort of advice would you give to a young meteorologist who suddenly is faced with three tornadic storms in their DMA and they might be, two of them might be away from their population center? Well, the first challenge is uh, with the people on the television station or the news director. You have to have the full support of uh, the television station, the owners, operators. They, they're going to give you a yes or no or a maybe on what you can do, where your limits are. And I think a lot of TV stations are probably restricted on, on what, how they can warn. You know, it has to be in the middle of Dallas before you can issue the warning, something like that. Uh, but uh, my primary theme has always been uh, Woodward, Oklahoma, for example, is about 110 miles, 125 miles northwest of us. And it's in our viewing area. Our viewing area is Titanic. It runs from just east of Tulsa all the way west of Texas. And uh, but you, it's always been the main. A life in Woodward, Oklahoma, is just as important as a life in Oklahoma City. Yes. And that's the way we approach it. And sometimes, you know, the, the storm might be 100 miles away, and it's tornadic, and we come on and interrupt programs, all those things, and people get very angry. I always say to them, well, the, the guy that lives out there, his life is just as important as yours. So that's always been kind of the theme. But when it really starts going, you know, at one time, I think, Rick can correct me, we had five or six major tornadoes on the ground at one time, all in the broadcast area, and most of them really big and nasty and vicious and dangerous. And it was a, it was a juggling act. We tried, to, and, and we covered the metro, probably more time on the metro, because it was coming to the metro, period. Uh, but we had to hit those outside areas, so it would be quick as we could. You know, we'd bounce to 
Uh, so I don't know whether the other ones were in, up near Enid, and we had one, we had two, two, two tornadoes hit up in uh, just north of us uh, in Logan County. And so they were over near Stillwater, and they're to the east at Stroud, and there was uh, one in the Dell City area. And so, but we bounced around, bang, bang, bang. But sometimes what we would do, the uh, helicopter would have a great shot, and we'd leave the helicopter shot up, and then and they'd go to audio from the storm trackers. And on that day, the storm trackers were just did a fantastic job, and it's just, so well needed. But we did bounce around. You can't really balance it evenly, you know. But if I know, I know my viewing area pretty well. I know what there's hardly anyone, you know, my home county of Dewey County, you know, you can drive for miles and there's nobody around. So you have to know the population uh, out there. And I guarantee you, the folks, at least in western Oklahoma, if there's a tornado out there and you tell them about it, you don't have to tell them much more than that. You know, they, they know what's going on. But it's a difficult jo job to try to bounce from one to the other. And sometimes you don't do a good job at it. And then, you know, people are really can be really mean to you. I can tell you one funny story if I have time. I'll get a shot of water here. <laughs> You've got all night, Gary. Okay. <laughs> this guy, uh, I don't remember the date now, but it was a big uh, cyclonic uh, thunderstorm to the west of Oklahoma City, and it was out there about 30 miles. And it was moving kind of south, southeast, but it was in, you know, in the metro or in the central Oklahoma. And uh, yeah, I do remember the date. I know it exactly. And so anyway, I interrupted this program, whatever it was. And I always try to get on off as soon as possible, but I interrupted because I thought it was significant. No tornado touchdown. And uh, he, uh, he wrote me an email, and, and he was the meanest, nastiest mouth guy. He called me every name in the books, and some of them I probably deserved. But he, he called me every name in the books, and so uh, the next day, it's May 3rd, 1999. So he sent me that email the, the night before uh, the uh, May 3rd tornadoes. As soon as the power came back up and all the stuff came back up, the first email I received was from him, and he was convinced that God was going to get him. <laughs> he, he was so embarrassed. He was he felt so terrible. But that's the way people are. You know, a darn TV, a show. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a, I have so many experiences. You know, I, I wrote a book once called uh, "Weathering the Storm," and I I thought you could write about anything that happened. It's for University of Oklahoma Press. So I wrote about no matter what happened, you know in the private offices of Channel 9 or wherever it was, I wrote about it, along with the severe storms. And I remember the, the editor called and said, I Gary, you can't write about those things. You know, people yelling, screaming, and saying things to each other. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, because I said, it happened. And she said, it doesn't make any difference. They're going to sue you anyway. So they wouldn't let me name the news directors. I had to give them a number. <laughs> that was in 90. Hey guys, that was in '95 or '96. I think I'd had 30 news directors by then. <laughs> wow. yeah, it was, uh, but it was it was interesting. So, I, but the thing is, I, I constantly try to learn, and I'm am still naive, and so I learn a lot. Things still surprise me because it seems like every year we say, you know, we really got this pretty down pass going, and, and then Mother Nature throws you a curve, and you learn each time. But yeah, I think you have to learn from every event, obviously, and uh, your mistakes, the good and the bad, and all those. But uh, it's a learning process, and I be on the air for another 30 or 40 years, it'd probably be the same thing. It'd be continuously learning. Think Gary, about with, with, without uh, right. naming names of the worst news directors you worked for, <laughs> who were the couple of the best news directors? I'm sure they wouldn't mind having their names thrown out. Who were the well, best folks you worked I for? I won't mention any names, but I will tell you the guy we have right now, Channel 9, I think the fabulous job. I think our news is probably the best it's ever been in the history of Channel 9, period, and in, in the market. So they, he just does a marvelous job. And he and I didn't always get along, but that's normal in the news and weather business. Uh, Al Sanderbray was a guy back years ago that came, and he and he was meaner than a junkyard dog, but boy, he was a good news director. <laughs> and, uh, and so we've, we've had a lot of good ones, and most of them are all good people, but some just you know should not have been put in the position they were put into. So, uh, but overall, you know, it worked. We got through it. Sometimes you've got to have a fearless leader who, who rules with sometimes an iron fist and also a very strong voice. Something I, I want to bring up real fast, Gary, and, and a follow-up to my that last question, wonderful answer, thank you so much, is remember, I'm, I'm sure, well, I know it was talked about on Weather Brains last week, about the guy in New York State, the TV meteorologist who blew out the last few minutes of the World mm -hmm. Cup because of a tornado warning. Now, yeah. in my time, I have blown out golf in Florida, NASCAR in East Texas, and I even blew out 
Because of a tornado warning at KLTV in Tyler, Texas, a pastor of First Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas, on a live broadcast, was walking <laughs> oh, the oh, yeah. when great, a tornado baby. warning came out. I had no choice but to blow out a Baptist church sermon in Texas. So the fact that I haven't been struck by lightning, hopefully I did something good that day. But in a situation like that, where you have a very, very popular program on TV, and of course, then it goes to The Bachelorette and Big Brother and the rest of it. What, what sort of advice would you give to meteorologists? How should they approach their bosses, their managers, and say, I know this is an important program, but if I have a tornado warning, I need to go on the air. Is there a balance, or would you suggest that if we have a tornado warning, you go for it? That, that's the way it should be. Yeah. You can't have excellent coverage. You can't save lives unless the meteorologist on duty have the right, have the permission to go with that warning regardless. So that and that, and that's how you develop a great, great, great uh, warning system. That's the first thing. You got, you have to have that that freedom to issue the warnings, make good decisions. You're going to make some bad ones. You know, you're going to make some. You just hope you make more good ones than you do bad ones. Uh, I, I. Uh, <laughs> So many things are coming to my mind now. Let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, but I would just I would, say it. I would, no, but I, would, I would just say, uh, let me tell you, sometimes, as, as Rick will tell you, and you guys know, warnings come out that the radar, the radar indicated, and there's no tornado comes down. But the, when that warning comes out in the weather service, we look at it, and usually we have a pretty good idea of what's going on, but the first question that goes to my mind is, is there a tornado? Yes or no? And if, it, if it's... Eh, I don't know. Then you really, very quickly, you're doing, looking at where the storm is with proximity to, to population. Uh, is anyone reporting a tornado? Are they getting large hit? Are you getting any reports that support this? And sometimes you can delay those. And there's sometimes, you know, a warning will come out, and I think the rib might tell you some are pretty well automated, and, you know, nothing happens. And sometimes we, all we'll do, is, if I judge a warning to not be extremely valid, I don't know if that's a good way to put it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run a crawl. I'll just run and crawl across a tornado warning for, you know, Lincoln County, blah, 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 radar indicated. And uh, then when you get on, you step it up if there really is a tornado. But those, that's kind of the process I use with it, and, and it's worked pretty well. But like I said, you still make some mistakes. I went on the, uh, the college basketball playoffs were on one time, and I've never been a big basketball fan. I just didn't follow it. <laughs> and so, you know, and, they, and the, we had storms come in from the west, man, and I, and it was really about who was playing with it. It was so popular here in Oklahoma, and everybody's excited about it, and this storm came up. And then on radar, we have really a high-resolution local radar that we have at the station. And it's just a very small hook develops, and it's just about a mile across, and it's totally curled. So it was a circulation that produced a tornado later that night around 150-something, 160-something. Uh, Rick would have to help me on that. But it, it was just, uh, there it was, and the game's on. And I kept waiting and waiting. We had storm trackers on. Once again, nighttime storm trackers are invaluable. And they were on it, still no tornado. So I, I ran all the way up. The game is over, all right? <laughs> and I come on, and I issue a warning. You know, I'm so pleased. I'm so happy with myself. <laughs> and, Lord, I didn't know that that song they play at the end, the end is real important. <laughs> 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 well, I thought they were going to burn the television station. <laughs> you don't interrupt one shining moment. I mean, that's right. that's one thing here in North Carolina. That's a, a lesson that you learn very quickly is is basketball, whether it's the tournament or whether it's just ACC basketball or preseason. You're you are taking your life into your own hands when you interrupt that. So we've got a whole other level of stuff that we do uh, whenever we have coverage. But I want to go back to. Talking about knowing your populations and sort of war stories, and I mentioned this in the chat, and everybody's like, "Oh, you got to tell that story. You got to tell that story." So President Reagan passed away, and there was this sort of week-long mourning process that the nation went through. There was, uh, you know, the the official stuff in D.C., and then at the end of the week, you had the funerals, and then they flew the body to California, and they did the service at the Reagan National Library. We've been through this week-long grieving process. We get to that uh, that last night. They're finishing up the service, and we've had severe weather. I'm working in Abilene, Texas at the time, and uh, we've had severe weather around the area. No tornadoes, but we've had uh, some severe thunderstorm warnings, and there's a possibility. And right as uh, Nancy Reagan leans down to kiss the casket, Ooh. I mean, we're getting to that moment at this, the pinnacle of this week, 
and a tornado warning was issued for uh, one of the more rural counties in our area. And our that's one of those cases where, again, you, you mentioned knowing your population. I knew roughly where that was, pretty decent radar, sign, radar coverage and sort of a marginal radar signature in an area where their cows outnumber people 30 to 1 uh, in Erie and County, Texas. Morgan knows where I'm talking about yes, that, down to the west of San Angelo. Yeah. And so I, I made an executive decision. I took my career into my own hands and said, let's, let's, let's just run the crawl. We had the little bug with the radar on it. Let's try and get past this. And then as soon as the talking heads of the network start talking, we'll, you know, we'll jump in and, and do the coverage. And fortunately, I think the good Lord was looking down on all of us because there's no, no damage, no uh, injuries and no tornado uh, found out of that. So I played the odds on that one, but I tell you, that's, that's a really sticky, sticky place to be. <laughs> it, it, it really is a tough, it really is a tough thing because what if, the one time that we end up not warning or not going on yeah. the air or delaying going on, right. and then what we battle against in the popular media, especially the national media, is the it hit without warning. Ugh. Well, if it actually did hit before we got on the air because we sat on NASCAR or because we sat on a golf tournament yeah. or the World Cup, I, well, I don't know if I want that on my hands. It's tough. Well, it is tough, and uh, what we do, when the warning comes out the weather service, the, the, the crawl automatically starts. Yep, like, yeah. uh, Nate, when you were talking, you made a good decision in doing that, and it was successful. Your know, life is just a series of decisions is what it is. Hopefully you make more good ones than bad ones, but it's, uh, it goes back, though, you ran the crawl. It goes back, really, what I think the people want to know is what is it, where is it, and where is it going? You know, you get the basic information on the crawl, but the crawl, our crawls run anyway. And uh, through the years, I've just developed a, a system. Sometimes, it's, I guess it's not even well thought out, but it works. It just comes to me on when to go with what and when to warn. And uh, you got to make those decisions. And sometimes they are tough ones to make. But uh, if, uh, sometimes, you know, people's lives are at risk, so you have to make sure you got it covered. If I don't care what's on. Now, I've interrupted the presidents. I've anything you name. I've interrupted it, and sometimes it needed to be interrupted. You have to do it, and you just get out there. And, and yeah, I, I remember being out there thinking, oh, God, they're going to kill me when I get off here. <laughs> but you have to get on. You have to cover it. But I think one of the things we make nowadays, a tornado <clears throat> warning comes out uh, for, say, this county in western Oklahoma, like the Dewey County. It's rectangle shape, pretty good size. There's a tornado warning, and, you know, storm trackers all around. Tornado warning comes out, and there's really nothing touches down. And yet it extended the warning extended from that county on to the next county. And so many of us, and I've done this myself, we stay on when it's a fact there's not going to be a tornado. The storm's weakening, may get some strong winds, and I think that does a lot to hurt us because you're on there just blabbing, and that's when they say, well, you guys are just talking about the same thing over and over and over, and, and that's really true, and nothing was going to happen. So I think it happens fairly frequently. So sometimes I think you have to make the decisions when you need to get your butt off the air. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen. Get off because right. Mabel doesn't really like looking at you. She wants to watch her TV <laughs> Gary, I had a flashback when you were telling the uh, NBA Finals story there. I think that was a night I was working, and we knew that storm was out west of Oklahoma City, and just and we were just like you, going, "Oh, please, let's just you know, either delay this or not have it happen." And you know, uh, we're we're sitting there too, feeling your pain and knowing that this is going to cause a lot of trouble <laughs> if we push this button right now. And and uh, so we held out as long as we could. Yeah. Uh, that's good. I appreciate that very much. I had a lot of great time. <laughs> the, guy that, the guy that owns Chesapeake Oil, you know, which is a fairly wealthy individual at that time, and he still is, he, he called my boss, the guy that owns TV station, get him off of there. He's interrupted. <laughs> 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 song. And my boss said to him, well, it's interesting, we checked the, he called him back and told him, he said, we checked the ratings, then, then and when the basketball went up, the ratings went off, the ratings went down, went, the, the ratings went up. Anyway, it's interesting. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, uh, you just got to do what you got to do to make the best decision possible. You yeah, know, Shelby, uh, you, you made an interesting <laughs> observation there in the chat about Gary. Why don't you point that out? Because I, I think that's something he'd want to share with the audience. So oh, he mentioned that life is a series of decisions, and I kind of laughed in the chat about it because I've heard that come out of Gary's mouth so many times about <laughs> so many different things. It's true. Like it, you, you get yourself prepared when Gary makes that statement, and then get ready to learn. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, the fun I have the most with the, the young people we get in from OU and, and the young ones we hire, 
go out to have the forecast ready, and they shall tell you this. And I say, well, what other than the models caused you to forecast that? <laughs> oh, my God. Sure. There comes that deer in the headlight look again. <laughs> said, what caused you to forecast rain? Do you really think it's going to rain, or did this thing just suggest it? Is that the easy way? I have a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> yeah, he did. I started interning for Gary after my first year at OU. I didn't know anything about anything. And he would come in there, why did you do that? Why do you think that's going to happen? I'm like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but he made you really think about why you were doing those things. Yeah, it's, it's, it is great fun. And, you know, people can learn a lot from it. <laughs> I Gary, you're good. Me. Your comments, Gary, are, are triggering thought processes for me, too. I My first day at the Weather Channel several years ago was the day that a hurricane was making landfall in North Carolina. And I'm sure this is probably, Shelby can say she had a similar occurrence with you. This is my first day at the Weather Channel with a live coverage of a major tropical event. And I'm, I'm standing next to John Hope while he's live on the air. And we went to commercial. I said, John, what can I do to help you? And he said, you just stand right there and you listen. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you touch anything. <laughs> don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. I'll tell you a quick story. Dan, I lived in New Orleans for four years, uh, as I mentioned, working for the offshore petroleum industry in forecasting. And uh, but I always wanted to go home to Oklahoma. I wanted to be on television. And so I went downtown there and got me an appointment with a news director, and I've forgotten his name. And uh, he was very good... Uh, newsman. I'd watched him on television. But anyway, I, I made the pitch. And he said to me, he said, I see no need for a telev television meteorologist now or ever. Hmm. <laughs> He's one of the news directors who shall not be named. To my name. <laughs> the Where is he now? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Probably <laughs> New York. <laughs> Something like that. You know, uh, it's, it's fascinating business. We talk about the young kids coming in. I think there's still a future in it, but you need to be good. I think I tell what I tell the guys, and Shelley will confirm this, I tell all the guys that the women are taking over. Because <laughs> I have found through the years, when you get an intern in, if it's a, like Shelby, a female, they come in and they say, okay, what do you want me to do? And you know, we write it down, blah, 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 this, 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 each. And, and the female will do that. They will do their job and ask questions. And a lot of guys you get as interns, you know, come in and you have to direct them. It's like a horse with a harness. You just kind of drag them around the <laughs> The room and say you need to do this, you need to do this. So th I think the gals work harder. In some cases, I think they're much more intelligent. So I think the guys need to bear down and get with it. Wow, gauntlet thrown <laughs> down on weather brains. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm totally Step playing. Game, I'm guys, play, I'm going to play that clip for my broadcast class that starts in about a month. They're going to get that every week. <laughs> and so, so what's so, the, so, pardon me. Gary, Gary you, you know, when we were watching you on May 31st, we were in New York City, and, and of course, that was stressful for, you know, everyone in the country, but we couldn't even imagine how stressful it was for you. How did the events of that day perhaps, you know, accelerate your retirement? Uh, yeah, I was supposed to stay on longer, but I'm very fortunate I had an agreement with Channel 9 at any time. You know, I felt like I just want to get off the air. I didn't even like the color of the walls. I could, I could take myself off the air and continue to be paid as if I was on the air. So I, that was really amazing that they gave me that type of deal. But, uh, we, you know, went through the 19th, which a lot of tornadoes, a few people killed. Uh, but an easy day, typical day. I think we had an F3, maybe a brief F4, I don't know, I'm sure. And then uh, the, tw uh, the, the 20th, you know, we had the, the Moore tornado and uh, just a lot of stuff. And then on the El Reno day, you know, the thing was just so darn big. And, it, you know, it was just like putting a water hose in a plastic sack. It's just spreading out. And I knew to the south, there's no exit. There's a river down there with no roads across it. And you, you, there's so many storm chasers out there and so many people on Interstate 40. And uh, the, 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 it was, uh, you know, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. You can go back and look at the historical data now from next red, and it just looks like, you know, big old thunderstorm, lots of tornadoes, big, big meso, huge mesocyclone, actually 2.6 miles across uh, that one tornado. And uh, you look at it, but boy, if you live it, it is. A, it's a scary deal. Because I, it, it was, thank God it didn't get into a populated area. It went a little south of El Reno before it turned north and, and got those guys and killed them. But it's, uh, it, it was just so, I guess it was high stress. Uh, and it, I just, I, it looked like it was going to take in parts of the east 
uh, El Reno, and they looked like, and you get into the Yukon area, and there's just thousands of apartments and such, and it was moving right toward them. And so a lot of stuff on that, and uh, a lot of people getting too close to the storms, and just a lot of things going on. So you can imagine. And uh, then that night, you know, the, the flooding, and all the people died in the flooding, and, you know, and that was early in the evening, I guess, in that vicinity. So when that ended, the storms ended, I don't remember the exact time. And usually I stay and go through the 10 o'clock and we review everything. I just called my wife and said, listen, uh, come get me. And she called me when she got up behind the station. I went out there and opened the door and I looked at her and she looked at me. I said, honey, that's it. No more. It's over. Hmm. So, so, so you say it's over, but you're still working for the company. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, the title you have and what your day-to-day -day, day -day gig is. I think a lot of people, you know, they, they think about being the, you know, I want to be the next Gary England. I want to be the next, you know, insert, you know, name of, of legend here. And then, you know, what's the next thing? What comes after that? And you have seen the promised land of not having mm -hmm. to chase the deadlines every day. What does that look like? Well, first of all, going through it, you know, I'm very lucky, uh, very blessed, right time, right place. And, and this guy uh, worked my rear off. But, uh, you know, in the early days, you, you couldn't leave the station because you didn't know what was going to happen. But now you can pretty well tell. But it's um, been a great, wonderful trip. It's rewarded uh, my family and I very, very greatly. We work for it. And so that's all been good. So uh, now what's it look like? Well, I, you know, I probably got the best deal in town. I, I, so far this year, I've given about 20, given about 20 speeches. And I love doing those because you're out with the public. You learn a lot. And you learn how, and you can, you got a chance there to question people about how they react to the various storms. I do that, and I'm gonna start doing a little piece on the air every so often called uh, uh, "I'll Keep You Advised." I believe is what we're gonna call it. A little bit of that. That's basically what I'm doing. That's uh, that's my job for about the next two years and two months. And it's really uh, my wife. Early, when I first got out of there. She, <coughs> excuse me. She's constantly saying, "You need to get this. You need to start doing that." And I, I said, you know, I'm pretty happy right now. I've been working since I was 16 years old. My gosh. And so I'm pretty happy. Uh, it looks good. Uh, I'm enjoying it. And, you know, people, as some of you listening here, finally get to retirement age. I know you young ones, and like Shelby, she thinks she'll never get there. Shelby, baby, I am your future. You will get there. <laughs> Keep that in mind. But it, it looks good. It feels good. I'm enjoying it. And a lot of people say, you need to get a hobby. I have discovered you can't get, just go get a hobby. It's got to be something, you know, it, it's just automatically there for you. But to answer your question, just short, it's it, it's been good to me, and it looks good right now. Thanks, Gary. One one final question. Uh, you you were one of the pioneers, certainly in TV weather nationally, certainly here in the Oklahoma City area with with radar and warnings and bugs and crawls and maps and all, everything that you kind of you know led the way on. Um, let you put on your forecasting hat one more time here. What what, what do you see in the next, I don't know, five years for, for TV weather? Start out maybe in the Oklahoma City market specifically. Any new things coming? Uh, any new fancy technology? Or, well, or how are we gonna how are we gonna one up things that you know that we've been doing and you know and just in general? What do you, I mean? What's your outlook for for uh, TV meteorology in general? Hey, well, let's let's assume, for example, here in Oklahoma City or any market, if the money's available at your station in the future, uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. One of the problems with television and, and many businesses right now, the audience is fragmenting. There's fewer and fewer people walking, so you got to watching, so you got to go out and get in those folks uh, who are on social media or the, the movie, wherever you got to bring all those in. But I, I, if the station has the money, there probably will be a uh, Great radar coming up. That's in fact that could be being worked on right now. That uh, probably will change things somewhat. I think the warnings are going to get better and better. Let me. I don't know about your location, but here in Oklahoma City, they're darn good. And uh, so the warnings are going to get better and better. Uh, I think. I, I I just I just I guess the point of this thing is it looks like to me the audience will become smaller and smaller. So you got to reach out and grab the other ones in. So you can't just be a weather person you, you've got to be whatever you know you, you know, hey I, I had to learn Doppler radar there were no there were no manuals for me to learn how to use that Doppler we, we bought and so you, I had to learn it to see to my pants I, uh, a guy down with the storms lab gave me a 
five by seven color photo of that experimental dew line Doppler radar, and, and that's what I had pinned up on my Doppler to try to figure out what was going on. So I just came through these things. And I think it's good lesson for everybody. I worked through that, and I was darn lucky, you know, to get through it okay. And it's like when social media comes, you know, it's pretty alien, but it's just, it's just something new that comes along. So my life, uh, my my career have been long and, and storied somewhat, but uh, it's it's there's just so many changes. So into the future, there'll be better radar systems. I don't know if stations will be willing to pay the money for them. I think the National Weather Service warnings will get better and better and better. I think uh, with the social scientists getting involved in how people react to warnings, that's going to be a great improvement. Uh, I think meteorologists on the air will always continue to be important. But I think in day-to-day, -day, less important. When it storms, Mabel wants to see her friend on television. you got to make sure you're that, you're that friend. So when it storms, I, tell, I don't care how tough they are, and how, if they may watch television once a year. If it storms, baby, they're going to watch TV. And so you've got to be the one that, that reaches out and grabs them. And, Gary, you're talking about uh, talking to Mabel there, uh, the <laughs> folks out in the rural communities. Uh, two quick questions real fast uh -huh. but as we start to wrap things up here. Um, first of all, as, as we all know, James is – really a master at knowing his audience mm -hmm. and those of us across the country here in Seattle have looked at that coverage from the Tuscaloosa tornadoes and the other tornadoes that James has covered and he knows every nook and cranny of his metro area and his DMA I imagine that that would be something that you would recommend to other new meteorologists that they get out in a car and travel and then secondly to wrap up what is the darkest day in your career is it more or some other date that you can recall oh I, I think uh, I think 2013 more yeah probably because of the kids yeah and it's and it, you know you know I, I've been in those schools so many times and we talked about years ago don't put the kids in the hall never put them in a the hall and that's where they were still putting them uh, but I regardless of where they've been if the results probably would have been the same that was probably the worst day yeah that one was and also, hey, as far as traveling around, I'm sorry, yeah. traveling around your metro area, uh, what would you suggest to a new meteorologist? How can they most effectively and most quickly understand their audience? Well, one thing is learn how to pronounce the towns and the streets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, yes. We've got a town named Visai. We've got a bunch of strange with Visai. And you can tell a new one that they call it Vicky. The tornado is near no. Vicky. Everybody says, where in the world is Vicky? <laughs> and so we learned to pronounce. Get your pronunciation guide for the towns. You know, we got Pusha yeah. Taha and and all these things, and these new new ones come in here, and you, and the audience essentially knows this guy's a newbie, and he doesn't know Oklahoma, you know, and he's probably from New York City. You have one cool. chance. You have one chance, yeah. and if you lose them, you can't get them back. Yeah, you know, learn the names of the towns, uh, learn where they are, where the population centers are. Always look. Uh, I always check out. Now you can do it on satellite. You can check for the uh, mobile home parks. There's a lot of people in those, and you know, it's extremely dangerous. And so uh, I pretty well know my market. So I think everybody gets in and uh, wherever they are, they get to learn their market of where things are, uh, the people are there, the demographics that are there, uh, their late night shifts, or people look going to uh, going to work at midnight and getting off at six, whatever. Find out uh, who who works when. Do you have big factories in your area where people are in there. So there's so much to keep in mind that you can hardly keep it up, but uh, you can do it. Listen, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm ceiling Oklahoma, baby. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Gary, Gary on, on episode 404, we had Mike Morgan on the uh -huh. show. And Mike uh, just, we, we, you know, we, we didn't want Mike to come on here to, you know, do anything other than to give him a chance just to share his side of the coverage of, of the El Reno tornado. How would you grade your coverage of the El Reno tornado? Uh, a being the I, best, F being the worst. F being the worst. Oh, you know, as far as the tornado itself, you know, we were probably up there, B, C, somewhere. It could have been better, I think, because I think when it turned, it actually that it rotated around. I, you know, we we didn't see that immediately as as it was happening, but. You know, our coverage, well, I don't think it was that, that excellent, but, you know, we covered the people. We kept the people in Canadian County safe later on with the rain and the floods, you know. Uh, in Oklahoma, so often we don't really talk a lot about floods. But the problem with the floods we had there, those people got down in the culvert, big old, those were big concrete ones, and they took shelter there. And that's the reason we had so many fatalities in the flood. 
if they'd stayed at home, they would have been fine. And uh, so, but our coverage overall, I thought was good. You know, I thought our coverage on more was an A plus. Uh, but the, I, the but the El Reno day just bothered me a lot because we had you know people so close to the tornado and not really aware of what it was really doing and it was difficult to keep up. Rick will tell you that was what it was doing. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, I, I, I've got I've got about a million questions, but I've only got eleven minutes, and I've got to go do what you used to do on the television <laughs> side. Oh man! Uh, but well, but James, let, 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 James, I will tell yes. you, I watched I watched your coverage down there on that big outbreak. It was absolutely marvelous. Cool, well, complex, kind of baby. That. It was sweet. I appreciate you saying that, Gary. Great. You're very kind. Yeah. One, one more question, or, or maybe a statement. Let's say somebody says this. Why, why would I stay up until 10 or 11 o'clock at night to watch the weather when I get the weather on my phone app? W what is the purpose of a broadcast meteorologist on a late newscast? How would you respond to that? Well, I get that all the time. I could be playing golf or with people, and they'll say, well, what's the weather going to be on Sunday? Before I can open my mouth, they all have their phones out. They're looking at it. <laughs> so I think that goes back to, as a day-to-day, -day, I think the meteorologists are going to become less important. Uh, storms, they'll always be important. So that time in between, uh, the times when it's not stormy on those good days, you have to be in the schools and the clubs. You have to go out and meet the people, talk to people. I know James is everywhere all the time, and you have to do that. You know, I, I have been to literally thousands of classrooms, and we finally got where we did the Terrible Twister show. We had many 7,000 people come to the Terrible Twister show. And that was, and what happened to all those people that came, we did those for 25 years, and it was it was a, it was was a like a circus. It was Barnum Bailey and music and lights and all this stuff and a lot of fun and a lot of tornadoes and, and a lot of safety. And what happened, those people that came and brought those little kids, well, those little kids grew up and not only had television, but they grew up and got married and, told, and trained their kids to watch us. So the key is getting out there with the audience, making friends. If you have to do it one at a time, you got to do it because during nice weather, unless they're really bored, they, they, I don't think they're going to watch that much. There's X number, there's a core that will, but then when it storms, exponentially larger. So I don't say much to those people. I think a lot when they say to me, or they don't say, they just pull out their iPad and their iPhone and read the forecast to me. <laughs> I don't say anything, yeah. brother. I'm thinking a lot. <laughs> yep. Well, so. let, let me let me do one more thing here, and we've got to play. Uh, we've got one recorded segment this week, and that's the fog bank. And I'm going to play that in just a second. But I wanted to say one thing, kind of changing gears before we go into picks of the week and all these other things that. And, and, and Nate's going to have to host the show after after this segment. Wanted to just say one thing about the Weather Channel and their new show, Weather Geeks. Uh, a lot of people. I think expected me to come on and just blast them for, yeah. you know, copying us and stealing our idea and, you know, you've been ripped off by these people and shame on them. No, I don't feel that at all. I, I, I consider Marshall Shepard a very good friend. Uh, I think he's great for the weather enterprise. He has done more to bring the weather enterprise together than anybody else during his year as president mm -hmm. of the AMS. Yep. And we are, I, I, I'm speaking for me, but I think I can speak for all of us. We're all for that show. Mm -hmm. These shows are radically different. You know, they're confined to television and we're not. And uh, even though we are on television, we're on cable, but, but even with that, we're not confined to commercial breaks. We're not confined to producers in our ears. Yep. We're, we're not confined to advertisers and, you know, you know, th this is a free-form show. Uh, it's just different. And, and by the way, on, on the Weather Channel show, they do not have the uh, polar vortex buzzer. <laughs> they don't have the global warming buzzer. They don't have the fog horn. I mean, they, see, they, they, these things you don't get on that show. So, no, I, I wish them all the luck in the world. I thought their first episode with, with our friend Chuck Doswell was great. We wish them the best. And as I look at our numbers... Uh, our viewing audience right now, people watching the live stream, it's at an all-time high, and I think part of that might be some carryover from the Weather Channel. So uh, I think it's good for us, and it's good for them. But I've got to go across the hall, so I'm going to roll the fog bank, and Nate, after that, the floor belongs to you, but let's go to Sky Day. Greetings and felicitations. Hello, Weather Brains listeners. Send links for the fog bank to Sky Daver on Twitter, and I'll use them and give credit. <clears throat> My first pick is NASA's IMAX film, The Earth, available on YouTube. Second, from Astronomy Picture of the Day, I've got a great aurora photo for JB. I've got Summer Solstice Sun Pillars from the Earth Science Picture of the Day. And finally, Red Sprites Over New Mexico from SpaceWeather.com. Thanks for listening. Skydaver out.
Transfer of data is complete. All right, thanks, Skydaver, and we will have those picks on weatherbrains.com after the show is pushed through post-production, as it were. This is the part of the show where we go around the digital mahogany table, talk about a pick of the week. This can be anything weather-related, whether it's an app for the iPhone, it could be a book or a website or whatever you'd like, and... Um, I'm going to let's see. We'll start with uh, Rick Smith since I see him. Uh, Rick, pick of the week from you, sir. <clears throat> well, uh, my pick of the week has to do with uh, a, a meeting coming up with the American Meteorological Society. Uh, it's the, uh, their uh, annual summer meeting, their community meeting, where we're going to get together and talk about some important issues. And social media is going to be one of those issues. I'm uh, very, very fortunate to have been invited to attend, and I'm going to be. Uh, on a panel with our, our good friend Dr. Susan Jasko and uh, uh, Ginger Z from Good Morning America and uh, a couple of other folks on the panel talking about um, the issue of you know weather is everywhere on social media and how do how do we deal with that and some of the issues related to that uh, it's a, I think it's a, a two and a half day or a three day uh, mm -hmm. meeting and that's coming up uh, the I think the second week in August. Yeah, the 11th uh, through the 13th, so I'm, I believe. I'm pumped about going there, and I wanted to be sure and plug that. So you can find the link uh, to that uh, meeting site, and if you're in the area, you know, you're know you welcome to come join us. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a little bit of live tweeting going on from there, and, and uh, certainly <laughs> um, you can see the agenda. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be invited to go, go, go participate in that and wanted to get that mentioned in this week while people had time to, to look at that and see if they might want to attend, join us. All right. Thank you, Rick. The uh, summer community meeting in State College, Pennsylvania, I think is where that is going to be held this year, 11th to the 13th. All right, next pick of the week, Dr. John Scala. I see you. Uh, what's your pick this week? Okay, Nate. Uh, Rick, I will see you. I will be at that meeting. It's just a couple hours down the road for me, so I will be there those three days. The pick of the week, Nate, this is for you. I'm part of the rapid response team <laughs> at the National Weather Association, and we put together articles on the web when there's a, an event of major importance. And so this anomalous midsummer cold air intrusion, yes, I'm one of the authors. <laughs> and so I'm giving you guys a, a sneak peek. It hasn't been listed yet on the, uh, on the web page, but the link will be on WeatherBrains, and you can take a look. All right, we've had a uh, fascinating discussion behind the scenes between me, John, and uh, one of my colleagues at WREL, Greg Fischel, talking about the this uh, lobe of the circumpolar vortex and all this other stuff. And, of course, James isn't here, so we can't do the uh, sound effects, but you get the <laughs> idea. Bill Murray, a pick of the week from you, sir. Yeah, uh, first next week we'll have Dr. Pam Knox talking about weather and agriculture. Dr. Ryan Maui, uh, the week after that, uh, Nate, that's going to be a fun show on July 30th. You'll have to pronounce our guest's name on August 4th, Nate Johnson. I have no shot. It's uh, Piotr Domasinski is going to oh, be my yes, best yes, guest. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, get with my colleague and we'll make sure we get that uh, pronounced correctly by then. That will be great. And you've got the guest on uh, the following week on August 11th, Rachel Witter with uh, her Updraft app. Dave Brown, Rick uh, Smith will be in charge of the guest on the 18th uh, from WMC in Memphis. And uh, Joan Von Ahn, another uh, one of Rick's favorite shows coming up on September 2nd, the day after Labor Day, talking about our old favorite show, AM Weather. And, of course, on Monday, October 20th, we'll be live from the National Weather Association in Salt Lake City. But my pick tonight is uh, a flashback to December of 2009, and that is the show with Gary uh, on show 202. I've got a link up there on the website uh, where you can download that show and talk, listen more about Gary's history and his book, Weathering the Storm, and a lot of things leading up to 2009. But, Gary, I want to thank you for tonight, uh, the interaction of the panel and everything. This was just one of the best, if not the best, weather brains ever, and we appreciate it. It was great fun. I appreciate being invited in, and uh, you all take care. Do I get my pick? Absolutely. You're oh, no, next. No, I'm not, I'm not, not cutting you off. Okay, and, uh, well, Nate, Johnson, I'm, I'm, I'm Nate make sure that uh, Morgan makes his comment before the show is over. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'll be going to a wedding Saturday. Oh. That's it, baby. I don't even know who's getting married. <laughs> so that's my excitement. That's my pick. There you go. Shelby, pick of the week from you, ma'am. 
Hey, a little bit lighthearted, but Time Hop, the app, you've probably seen every teenage girl that you're friends with on Facebook <laughs> using it. And I didn't want to use it at first either, but finally gave in, downloaded it. It's really fun. You don't have to think about what happened on this day last year. Like, oh, it's cold in Oklahoma City today. Well, you know what? It was cold on this day in Oklahoma City last year, too. Not that big of a deal. But love Time Hop and have really enjoyed seeing. Now, what was I doing this day last year, three years ago? A uh, frequent user of Time Hop and infrequently confused for a teenage girl, Morgan Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am actually a frequent user of Time Hop. I'm up to five years on social media. It's a really, really neat resource, so check that out. I've got the U.S. Forest Service Air Fire Research Team, and here in the Northwest with the smoke, they have the blue sky weather smoke forecasts. Uh, this will be on the WeatherBrain's website, but it's viewer.smoke.airfire.org, and you have different daily runs from the wharf, from the Canadian, from the GFS, and it depicts where smoke is uh, projected to go over the next few days, potentially out to seven days, so it's a really great pick there. Also, can't wait for the um, the uh, uh, Weather Brains about AM weather. That's a show that's close to my heart. As a youngster, when AM weather was on and when AM weather went off the air, it was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And I remember that last show. Anyway, also, um, as far as Gary uh, goes and your your backdrop there, we were chatting here on the Weather Brains uh, internal <laughs> chat room here. That I'm halfway expecting someone in a scream mask to come walking out from behind you there. It's a little dark where you are tonight, Gary. This is not easy to set up, let me tell you. I'm all, only do, right, Gary? I'm, yeah, I'm all humped up like a show dog here trying to... <laughs> show here. title, show title. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's been interesting trying to not fall out of the chair. <laughs> well, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the weather going on across the Fruited Plain, and, and one of the reasons that uh, we invited Morgan on not only to uh, just admire his his golden pipes, <laughs> but uh, also to uh, talk a little bit about the West Coast, you know, the, the polar vortex or whatever you're going to call it that has uh, really brought a fantastic pattern of weather for most of the eastern two-thirds oh, wow. of the U.S., has um, has really changed things for folks. Hey, there's light at Gary's <laughs> house <there> now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it is a big time in the in the city tonight. All right, uh, but Morgan, let's talk a little bit about the weather going on in the in the West Coast and uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, out there, you guys are dealing with some heat and a chance for thunderstorms. Yeah, it really has been amazing. We we had a, we had a long stretch of 80 plus weather. In fact, uh, I, I know 80 plus weather is not considered heat, and, and uh, this stretch uh, of uh, 12 days was not really a very hot stretch. We had a couple of days close to 90, and one day at 90 degrees, uh, but 12 days at 80 plus in Seattle, and that's highly unusual for us. In fact, we have not had a day at SeaTac Airport where we strung together 12 days of 80 or better warmth since 1977, 37 years. And that was simply the function of the ridge here on the West Coast and the polar vortex or whatever you want to call it there <laughs> on the East Coast. Something that's also very wacky about our weather up here is we surpassed our rainfall, our February to July rainfall record. We surpassed that back at the end of May. And then the rain stopped, and we have had very little rain. In fact, only about half the amount of rain that we normally have in the month of June, 46 or so percent. And then we've only had a trace of rain since the 28th of June at SeaTac Airport. Now, July is normally our, our driest month of the year at uh, less than an inch of rain on average, but only a trace of rain. Some other areas have had a bit more rain. In fact, at the station yesterday, downtown Seattle, we had quite a bit more rain than the airport does, but that's where the, the bucket is. So we had an incredibly wet start to the year and that was that caused in part that horrible landslide you might remember at Oso Washington along the Stilaguamish River that killed more than 40 people back in the spring and since though uh, since the end of May we've had extremely dry weather here in the northwest and uh, John Scala going to talk a little about the rest of the weather across the US and um, the craziness, whatever you want to call it, it has resulted in, uh, at least for me, my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed have been filled with people going, this is great. You know, if this is global warming, I want more of it. But uh, 
what uh, what are we dealing with out here, and how long is it going to last? And you are muted, sir. We'll need to unmute you. Good. There we go. James always likes to talk about my clocks going off. I, I like to have lots of <laughs> clocks in the house. You know, my kids tell me they're always set for different times. Well, they're really not. But anyway, they, I muted so that all the clocks are going off at 11 my time. <laughs> well, the active weather this hour is actually moving across eastern North Dakota. That's a short wave that's moving towards uh, Minnesota. And there's some warnings out. We've had more than uh, 70 reports of severe weather. But here in the east... As fate would have it, uh, we're planning a vacation at the beach next week, and if you've looked at any of the longer-range models, <laughs> mm -hmm, how about a closed low in the eastern U.S. next week? Not what I want to see, but very tranquil weather, actually, and very comfortable for this time of the year in the east. We do have a new tropical depression that was identified this afternoon that is still east of the Antilles. At this point, not expected to last more than a couple of days. Not expected, at least as of the last forecast update, to become Tropical Storm Bertha, which would be the next name, but uh, something that uh, they'll continue to watch, even though the environment a couple of days down the road is uh, not quite favorable. Well, uh, we typically will spend a couple of minutes talking about some news that's going around across the weather community and have a couple of bits. Number one, if you, are, if you have sent in an abstract for the National Weather Association annual meeting that's coming up in mid-October in Salt Lake City. They are the program committee starting to send out acceptance notices to some of those. I have personally gotten a couple of those and a number of other folks I know have begun to get those as well. A preliminary agenda for the meeting will be posted in mid-August, uh, so in about another three or four weeks, we'll have an idea of where those talks are going to be and, uh, in terms of where they'll fit in the program and that sort of thing. Uh, last I'd heard, the hotel for the conference was almost full, if not past full, so if you're planning on attending, you do want to go on ahead and make your hotel reservations now. And, uh, of course, it's going to be, it sounds like it's going to be a great meeting. They've had a record number of abstracts for that annual meeting, and so they've got the pick of the litter in terms of uh, talks for this year. The NOAA, the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, honored somebody today for doing something more than 150,000 times over the course of the last 84 years. Mr. Richard Hendrickson has been filing cooperative observer reports twice wow. a day for 84 years. He is 101 years old and will receive an award here in the next little while um, for his service to the country and to the National Weather Service. He'll get the uh, award in the Upton, New York office to which he's been making the bulk of those reports over the last 84 years. Now, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Rick, I'm going to lean on your memory here. Um, 84 years ago, we didn't have a National Weather Service. We were a couple of iterations before that, I think. Were we still the Weather Bureau at that point? Were we something even before that Signal Let's Corps, perhaps? Let's see. We were at least the Weather Bureau, and then we, I think we were probably the Weather Bureau at that point. Okay. Oh, gosh, that's that's incredible. I saw that story today, and yeah. I, I, I was just amazed by that. That's dedication for sure. That's pretty good to uh, crank something out again. 150,000 times. It's twice two reports a day uh, right. for 84 years. That is uh, impressive. And Mr. Henderson, we salute you, sir. Thank you for your service to uh, weather weenies around the world, and of course to uh, to the country. We certainly appreciate that. If you have any news items, you can send those send those to us here. Weather brains. At, uh, or email at weatherbrains.com. You can tweet those to us or uh, hit us up on Facebook as well. Pretty much if you go to a social media platform and type in Weatherbrains, you're going to find us, okay? Um, even though there is the other show that uh, James mentioned, Weather Geeks, that debuted on Sunday at noon with Chuck Doswell. Jason Salmonow will be uh, on next week's program. And as James mentioned, you know, I think it's a really great opportunity. I don't know that we have have saturated the market here on Weather Brains, and I think there's certainly room for uh, somebody else to pop in. They reach a different audience than we do, uh, certainly with the cable TV program and uh, having uh, Dr. Marshall Shepard as a, a key part of that show, I think, is going to serve us all well across the uh, weather community. We certainly appreciate that. Um, I did, uh, Gary, have one question from a couple of friends of mine who uh, do the weather up in Tulsa, John Boyer and James Adelot at uh, Fox 23 in Tulsa. They want to know, what's your favorite 
barbecue, both a style and if you have a favorite restaurant. What's your What's your favorite cue, sir? Oh gosh, you know I like all kinds of food, uh, <laughs> but amazing. barbecue specifically barbecue. barbecue. Well, I really like Mexican food a lot. Let's see. Well, we had uh, we had a uh, barbecue place right down the road in Channel Nine. I used to go there a lot, but then the proprietor killed somebody in the door there, and so that place closed down. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but it was really hot. I, I hot. shot a man in the barbecue restaurant just to watch him die. Right in the front door, man. Wow. And so, but you know, I I like it. I, I like spicy stuff. But I like pork ribs, beef ribs, whatever. I like about anything. I like banana cream pie, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Shelby, you spent some time in Oklahoma and now in Arkansas. What's your favorite kind of barbecue? Oh, goodness. I don't know. I guess I'm going to avoid the question, like Gary. No, you I can't avoid barbecue. the question. I'm up here in Seattle. You can't avoid the question. <laughs> Seattle is Barbecue is something that Seattle does not do well. Okay, if you get to Norman, you have to go to Ray's. It's on um, Lindsay and Ray's amazing barbecue. And you have to get the macaroni and cheese. That's my favorite part. Oh, nice. Morgan, what's your, uh, you, you know, Seattle is a barbecue wasteland. I, I feel for you. I pray for you daily, sir. But uh, what uh, what's your favorite barbecue up there or uh, down in Texas? I know you spent some time there. Uh, really up here, I, I really don't have a favorite up here. It's it's very tough. There are a couple of uh, great uh, uh, Mexican food trucks, one called El Camion, which is uh, in several different places around the Seattle area, including outside of the Seahawks Stadium. Fantastic. Burritos as big as your arm. Uh, and great hot sauces, Whoa. but barbecue, barbecue. I have to go home to Texas. I'm a Texas boy, Abilene, Texas, right here. And uh, barbecue and steaks. I fly home for that. So, what's your uh, of all the? I was just in Abilene a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Which of all the the joints that are still there? I mean, Harold's I think holds a special place yeah. in my heart. The first desegregated restaurant in Abilene. Some of the best barbecue. Uh, Harold got out of the business a few years ago, uh, much to uh, my unhappiness. But uh, of the the joints that are left, what's your favorite? You figure. Well, you know what? Uh, Square's Barbecue years ago, I and mean, that's when I was growing up, and I mm -hmm. haven't lived in Abilene since 1999. My mother's barbecue is pretty darn good. As there far as go. steaks go, the Beehive in Albany, Texas, and, of course, yeah. Perini, Perini Ranch. Buffalo Gap. Yes. I mean, Morgan and I have... Morgan and I are, are, are connected in the sense that we barely missed each other. He moved out of Abilene in 99, and I moved in in 2000. Yeah. And I took over at the ABC station there. Um, had a, a six of the best years of my life. Found a wife there, it's, uh, and was you know just was back there for a week, just a couple weeks ago. Had a great time. So, Good time. Uh, Rick and John, your favorite kinds of barbecue? Since we're you know we're asking the panel here, <laughs> Rick and I um, were just talking about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, being from Memphis, I I I'm kind of partial to the the Memphis barbecue. I got to spend some time in Kansas City a couple weeks ago and sampled some of that. That was great too, but. I'm kind of partial to ribs and uh, really like Corky's and really like the Rendezvous in, in Memphis if you get over that way. And uh, the place Shelby mentioned is really good. And, and John, there's a, a place that you like, I think, that's not too far from our office. Yeah, it's, on, it's Highway 9, isn't it? It's, yeah, yeah. It's Rudy's, and I like hot sauce. I don't even use salad dressing. I use hot sauce. I put hot sauce <laughs> on everything. <laughs> and that place has the best barbecue that I've ever eaten. It's, I've had Rudy's. The original one down in uh, San Antonio was part of a gas station, I think, or some sort of a this market. And it's, Those are always the best. Yeah, that's that was uh, the original one's good. They've they broke it, branched out and done the chain thing, but I think they've done it to uh, to great effect down there uh, in Texas. I I, um, I love barbecue. You will not be able to pin me down a, into one particular style or type. I, I will eat it all. Um, so yeah, you pretty much. I'm not going to turn down a plate of barbecue, and you won't be able to pin me down to a favorite. So uh, just invite me down. You're more than welcome to try. Although I have some great <laughs> memories of uh, of a lot of barbecue. I, I uh, did a lot of traveling, of course, to Dallas when I was in Abilene, and also down toward San Antonio, and then down toward Houston. So got around a little bit in uh, Texas, and pretty much that was the first place. I first thing I'd look for is a good place to eat barbecue. Um, to love the brisket, love the sausage, and something that we don't get a whole lot uh, of around here in North Carolina. We've got pork barbecue, and if you ever have the chance, uh, look up. There's a YouTube video by Rhett, R-H-E-T-T, -T, and Link called The Barbecue Song. It's three minutes of your life, I promise you. 
You will love it. It's good stuff. A couple of good Carolina boys doing good. Well, finally tonight, I we saw this on our Skycam, one of our Skycams here in Raleigh. We had big heavy rain this morning, flooding in Durham. And then this was a shot of the ballpark that we owned. They had a baseball game being played at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park this evening. Oh, yeah. They needed to dry out the field, and so they called in the helicopter. They actually flew in a helicopter to dry off the infield grass and the uh, the dirt in the infield to try and get the uh, the game in. And as a matter of fact, they did they did get the game game in tonight. They were able to dry out the field. But we saw that uh, Mike Mays, one of our meteorologists, caught that out of the corner of his eye uh, right before we did weather at 5 o'clock, and uh, we put that on the air. That was just a great shot. So this is uh, the weekly All About the Weather netcast called Weather Brains. Uh, Gary England, we really certainly appreciate you being our guest for the night, and I certainly wish you all the best in your, uh, your endeavors over the next two years and two months of uh, giving school talks and civic group talks and keeping everybody else in Oklahoma and the rest of the TV business in line. We certainly appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. It was great fun. Good deal. Morgan Palmer and uh, Shelby Hayes, we certainly appreciate having you here as well. Morgan, how can folks find you on the interwebs if they want to get to know you? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, MorganCairo7. That's K-I-R-O-7. All of my social media links, though, are at MorganPalmer.tv. So if you go to MorganPalmer.tv, you'll be able to find everything I do. And you're available for voiceover work, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps so, if the bosses say so. There you go. Shelby Hayes, how can folks uh, find you in Arkansas these days? Oh, on Twitter still at ShelbyWX. Always be there, and it has all my other links on that one. Very good. Certainly appreciate having everybody here this week. We'll be back next week. We normally record the program live on Monday nights at 9.30 Central, 8.30, or sorry, 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central, 7.30 Mountain, 6.30 Pacific, Pacific. right, Morgan? 6.30 Pacific. That's exactly right. There you go. Um, you can find us pretty much just type in Weather Brains into your web browser, into the search box at Facebook, Twitter, whatever. You'll probably find us, and we certainly love hearing from you. If you have a suggestion about the show, you think we ramble on too long, or you think <laughs> shoot, we really want it to be longer, uh, shoot, shoot us a note, email at weatherbrains.com. We love to hear from you. We love the uh, comments on iTunes and Stitcher. That's where most folks uh, listen to the program after we record it. It is available in podcast form, and you can find links to all of that on weatherbrains.com. And for those of you listening, perhaps for the first time, as a result of the show on the Weather Channel, Weather Geeks, we certainly welcome you, certainly appreciate you uh, watching the, the program this evening or listening this week, and we hope you will continue to do so. And if you have any thoughts about what we're doing here, we certainly love to hear from you. Just uh, send us a note either on email or on social media. Until next week, I am not James Spann. Good night and God bless. Folks, thank you very much, Gary. We certainly appreciate having you here. Thank you very much for being here and uh, yes, wish you all you so the best. Much. I appreciate that. It was great being here. I'm sorry for the cavern look, but I sprayed the lights would be too bright. <laughs> it was it was perfect. It worked out well. It was mood lighting. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and I now need, I love I the fact I love the fact that uh, you look at his office there and you've got the Twister movie poster yeah. in the back and then some of the great uh, shots there of uh, weather there on the side. That's ideally what my office office would look like. Cool uh, storm pictures. But. Mm -hmm. Morgan, Shelby, certainly appreciate having great you as well. Guys. Thanks for being here. Great being here. Bye-bye. Y'all yeah. sure. take care. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thank see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. Let's see.
Ooh, 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 ooh. You know what time it is. It's uh, 35 after the hour. The television news is complete. The IFB is now off of me. By the way, guess where I bought this? You know, and yeah, the station provides these things. Always have, but for some reason, and I guess it's my fault, we used to go to this place where they make the ear mold. And recently, just to save time, I didn't get the ear molds. I just got the generic things that go in your ear, and they never fit in my ear. Like, my ear's too small or too big. I got this deal from Amazon.com, and it really fits my ear. So it was like 10 bucks or something. So, uh, hey, that was great having uh, Gary. Um, you know, the, he's part of my generation, and we're kind of fading away, which just happens. We're just getting old. Uh uh, but it was great having him on the show. You, you look at the uh, guys that have been around through all these decades, through the, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the O's and the 10s, and there's not that many of us left. Uh, uh, but Gary's always been an inspiration for me, and I've enjoyed watching his severe weather coverage, especially you know when the Internet started uh, allowing live streaming and you could watch all these stations. And I, I uh, you know, what. What I, I and I had so many questions for Gary. I wanted to talk about winter storms. We we, we didn't get into winter storms with Gary. And he, he's kind of you think of Gary England, you think of tornado coverage. But the truth is, they have some wicked winter storms in Oklahoma. Ice storms and snowstorms, and uh, you know how he handles that. I, I I'd love to talk about that. But you know he's been through a lot. But but I'll say this for him to survive at that place for so long, very few people do that, and uh, uh, it's just great. And, and I'm glad that he's you know. And a chance to live on the other side of the hill, where you're not having to worry about doing these, uh, you know, evening newscasts all the time. Uh, and I guess all of our time will come. But uh, great having him on the show tonight, and uh, appreciate all you guys uh, watching and listening. In fact, I'm stunned at the number of people that are still uh, uh, watching this. I'll have to look at the numbers. I think we had an all-time record high number of live uh, views. And again, for the, for those that have never watched this before, uh, we're we're primarily an audio show. You know, Gary didn't have any lights on him, and we we need to do a better job of getting our guests illuminated. We know that, but uh, I think about three and four people are still listening to the audio produced version of this. Uh, and this started as an audio show, and and you know it's still dominantly an audio show. We we ported it over to television or video for uh, cable television here, and, and and for what we do here. Uh, but anyway, it was great having Gary, and, and appreciate him taking the time to join us. Uh, um, I love debriefing the legends like that. We had great panelists, and great to have Morgan. Man, are you kidding? No human should have a voice, pipes like this guy, and that kind of hair. I mean, that just should be illegal. <laughs> but we're going to do all we can to make Morgan the official booth announcer of Weather Brains. Man, he's got some uh, great pipes. But no, and one more thing on the Weather Channel show. You know, I got a lot of notes from people saying, "I know you're going to jump on those guys for copying you and all this." No. Uh, they can't copy what we do. They can copy the idea of doing a weather geek show, which is what this is. This show is not for the masses. This show is for people that love weather. This is for weather nerds and dweebs and dorks. You know, and how many times have I said that over the years? Um, and, and that's what their show is for. But like I was saying on, on, on the, in the core of the show tonight, that it is apples and oranges. Um, I'm telling you, when, when you were doing television, you know, doing a 30-minute show, number one, with all the commercial content, your actual time you get is like 15 or 18 minutes. And when you got Chuck Doswell, you can't do that in 15 minutes, in my opinion. If you want to, if you want to hear Chuck, go back to just search out Chuck Doswell and Weather Brains, and you got two hours of Chuck on this show, where he just says whatever he wants to say, and and that's the nice thing about it. You know, if we want to go two and a half hours, we go two and a half hours. If we wouldn't go 30 minutes, we go 30 minutes, and we don't have the time constraints. There's no producer, no consultant goobs, you know. Uh, we, we just do whatever we want to do here, good, bad, whatever. It, it is the raw thing. It's just us, and uh, it's a very refreshing platform. It's our creative outlet. Most of us here, we do these, you know, strict formatted television weather segments, and we, we need this, and uh, that, that's the reason it started, you know, eight years ago, and we're just going to keep on keeping on, but I, I really hope that it works. And, and like I said, Marshall Shepard, who hosts that show, is uh, on the sta the faculty at the University of Georgia, and um, uh, he he did more to bring the weather enterprise together, I think, in his year as president of the AMS than anybody else. He reached out to those of us on the operational side, 
said, hey, you're welcome here too. You know, for, for, for a long time, it just seemed like we just need to go hang out with the National Weather Association. Those are our people, but he's kind of bringing us back in the fold and making us feel welcome. And uh, again, the, 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 there's obviously one big issue that's tearing the, you know, the, that's splitting us. And, and I hate to see that. You get, you know, this, and I'll buzz myself. Um, but that topic has polarized the weather community, much like politics has polarized the nation. And I really hate that because I, I've seen some really good people get so locked in on one side of this debate that they just don't talk to each other and they say ugly things about each other and it's just been bad. So uh, Marshall, I think, started maybe to help heal that. Not that it's ever going to be totally healed, but anyway, I, he's a great host for the show and uh, I love what they're doing and I wish him all the luck in the world. And I really do mean that. It, it, we are apples and oranges. We're fruit, but we're different. So, And having said that, we better go because it's like, what, we, we've been on here for... Two hours and thirty minutes. That's long. Hey, uh, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, and again, if you want to get in touch with us, you know the deal. The email it is email at weatherbrains.com, and uh, go to the website for the show notes. In fact, I have to do the show notes because Brian's not here, so I got to finish that too. So I got to go. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great week. God bless and good day and good night.